do you think that's potentially unhealthy for someone? And do you think that we evolved to reproduce and have a family? And do you think that there's consequences that maybe they just don't foresee yet? Yeah. I mean, certainly different strokes for different folks. Some people can make it to the end of life having not had kids or a family and say that it's the right call. Yeah. But you've had to beat the odds pretty hard. Yeah. I thought I wasn't going to. You're an outlier and you've had. Yeah, I'm 41. Yep. And I, I have a three-year-old son now. Congratulations. So, but my, and my wife and I, we've been together for 13 years. And yep. so there was a point where we were very Hormozy-esque. Like we, she's part of the business. Like yep. we built companies together before, like hardcore motivated like that. And there was this thought that, you know, maybe we'll, we won't have kids. And that changed. And now I look back and go like, oh my God. Like, Imagine if we hadn't done this. Yeah. It's very strange because it's hard, I think. I'm an, not a parent, not as far as I know. And it, it's very difficult for non-parents to imagine the kind of enjoyment that they're going to get out of having kids. Because there's a lot of very obvious reasons about why you shouldn't have kids, right? Yeah. All of the time that they're going to take up and the difficulty mm -hmm. and the yeah. potential risk of them becoming injured or, or, or killed. And then you're going to be heartbroken and you'll never get over it and all of these things. It's very hard for parents to actually explain to you the meaning and satisfaction they get out of having kids. Yeah. And the moment to moment experience, if you do self-rated happiness of parents, they're less happy than non-parents, mm -hmm. yeah. but they have much more meaning in their life. Mm. So like, you know, when you're up for the third time tonight mm. with a one-year-old that's teething or whatever's going on, like that's not happiness, but over time you start to accumulate an awful lot more meaning. So I, people can do whatever it is that they want. Um, I am slightly <coughs> concerned about childlessness especially in the West at the moment, the mm. <clears throat> population collapse is fucking terrifying yeah. and it is coming for every developed country. I want to touch on that because, well, first off, the data on this is actually uh, pretty clear that the people that do find meaning and purpose that don't have kids typically devote their lives to something that they, uh, it's, it, it transcends them. So it's either something religious or spiritual or they volunteer for work or do something that they dedicate their lives to like mm. mother Teresa, for example. Um, so, and, and it's hard to explain because you don't know what it's like to truly care about something more than yourself. And I think until you have kids, otherwise you really don't, unless you have that one purpose in life. Well, like that I was said, my experience. Is, my experience was until that moment, I didn't realize that I had never truly loved something more than myself. I love my wife. I love my mom. I love my sister. I love, I love my friends. And I say stuff like that. But until that moment of seeing uh, another being a part of you that you're now responsible for, all of a sudden <laughs> that what I would say for me was real love for the first time, something that I actually love more. And you couldn't myself. have imagined it other, otherwise. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you mentioned um, population collapse. Mm. So, and I, and I, if you read about this and you look at the data, this is a big deal. And some countries are freaking out. I know Japan is in a bad position. I know Italy, where my family's from, in a bad position. America's on the cusp. We're like the line where, where we may experience this. China is suffering now from kind of what happened. What? Why do you? Why are we getting the message that uh, we need to have less kids? That populate that we're going to get overpopulated. That we're running out of resources. That population um, is a threat to us in the sense that we're having too many. Kids, why are we getting that message when the data is showing the opposite? It's way worse than you think. However bad you think it is, the current decline in birth rates is significantly worse. So there's a guy called Stephen Shaw who's just released a documentary called Birth Gap, and he's been on uh, Modern Wisdom, my show. And this guy just totally blew my head off. He became obsessed by this question around about six or seven years ago. He's traveled to 24 different countries. He's a data scientist by trade. Uh, and he has looked at the declining birth rates across the world. First off, why is it that people have a problem with the amount of people that are on the planet and say that it isn't an issue perhaps that the population is declining? It's because of a fundamental belief that the world's carrying capacity is already being breached, right? That we already have too many people on the planet. This ties into environmentalism and the green movement and stuff. And no matter what you think about like parts per million carbon in the atmosphere, the earth has way, way, way more carrying capacity than we're at at the moment. Remember the population boom? Yeah. There's going to be a population bomb or a population boom in the 70s and 80s. Well, that never ended up happening. It looks like we're going to top out just under about 10 billion people, but the fall off from there is going to be precipitous. You can have a declining birth rate whilst an increasing population. 
because the amount of time that people live for is getting longer, mm. right? So if you have an ever aging population, you can actually drop birth rate and increase the size overall. But what you end up with, if you imagine a, a graph where you have a zero years old, one, two, three, four, all the way up to a hundred, that creates a shape, right? Of the demographic. Once you've had one-year-olds, there are no more one-year-olds that can be born right now. We know exactly how many there are. This is where the term demography is destiny comes from. So we know exactly how many one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and then in 80 years time, we know how many 81-year-olds, 82-year-olds, if you account for the drop-off. So you end up with this shape, right? To the demographic. What you want is this. You want more young people than old people because they're the ones that drive innovation, that drive GDP, that are actually physically able to look after old people. If you have a shape like that, this sort of inverted triangle shape, that's really not good because you have more old people than young people. And that's the current situation. 70% of countries worldwide are below the birth rate tipping point. That means that the women in those countries are having less than two children. That's the number that you need in order to sustain society. So if you, everyone remembers this R0 number, right, from the mm. pandemic, if you have fewer children, that means there are fewer children to have fewer children. So you end up falling off a cliff on and the other side. At some point, it's just you can't, re you can't recover. It's, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Now, what you will end up with in America, for instance, certain subcultures that are repopulating pretty well, Mormons, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, you have within particular, mostly religious, uh, traditional conservative sect. I mean, like Matt Walsh has had like six kids. Yeah. I think he's had two sets of twins, right? So, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be a lot of Matt Walsh's running around. But <laughs> even in the places where people would say at sub-Saharan Africa, everything's going to be fine. Every 15 years, the average number of children that each mother has is dropping by one. So it's six, then it's five, then it's four. And we're at six to five now-ish, even in the places that everyone thinks are having it away. Japan, that you brought up, 120 million people in it at the moment. By 2050, that's going to be 60 to 65. China, 1.2 billion people in it at the moment. By 2050, that's going to be 650 million. South Korea, same problem. UK, USA are at sort of 1.8 to 1.6 in terms of their birth rate. It's really, really, really not good. And the interesting thing about population collapse in terms of demographics, it's the least exciting and least galvanizing of all of the existential risks, right? There's no super volcano spewing out ash. There's no asteroid in the sky. There's no Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger crashing through the ceiling to galvanize us to doing stuff. There's no smoke from chimneys and stuff. It creeps up on you one year at a time, one generation at a time, one lost child at a time. And before you know it, there aren't enough people on the planet. So for the people that have, you know, legitimate concerns about what's happening with the environment and stuff like that, if you think that living on this planet is bad when you believe there's too many people on it, wait until you see what it's like when there's too few. Now, what are they attributing this to? Is this uh, also, are they associating this with the fact that we've moved further away from religion? Because you mentioned these some of these religious cultures that are uh, definitely still promoting uh, having multiple kids. Third rail alert. So <laughs> it, it seems like the two things that cause population uh, birth rates to decline are the education of women and industrialization. Those two mm. are across the board. And the reason that this happens the reason you can tell that this is the case is that you have, um, let's say Japan. In Japan, I think all schooling is private and everybody pays for it. In some of the Scandinavian countries, all schooling is uh, supplemented and paid for by the state. You have certain countries that are authoritarian, some that are democratic, some that are egalitarian, some that are patriarchal, some that, you know, you have every different type of culture that you can. So you think, okay, what is it that all of these different countries, 70% of countries are below the birth rate tipping point. What is it that all of them have got in common? And it's been this increasing industrialization and education of women. To put it out there, front and foremost, I am not saying that we should stop educating women, right? That's not my proposal at all. We're going to clip that. Yeah. But this is, this is where, this is the correlation, it seems. As soon as you educate women, the birth rate falls precipitously. That is a really uncomfortable truth, right? That's just what happens. Why is that what happens? It seems like if women are able to gain education and employment, they spend more time learning and then more time earning, which then squeezes that fertility window down, right? If you've spent up until the age of, what, 23 in school, and then you go, well, I've you know, spent 18 years in full-time education, I might as well go and actually earn. So then you're talking maybe five years in a career before you actually start to properly look to settle down. Again, this is obviously on average. There's mm -hmm. many students at university that will also have kids with a partner and get married and stuff. Then you're talking 30. It's 
very, very difficult for women to understand just how limited their fertility window is. And eight out of 10 women who are childless didn't intend to be childless. Eight out of 10? Eight out of 10. Eight out of time. I did not know that. It's called involuntary childlessness. Wow. So uh, around about 10% of women are physically incapable of having kids for a variety of reasons, which is just brutal. 10% said that they actually didn't intend to have children. And that leaves a whopping four out of five who didn't have children due to life circumstances. That's the most common reason for it. And the most common life circumstance is leaving it too late to find a partner and then have kids. You break through that fertility window on the other side. And there is, this is Professor Renske from uh, mm -hmm. Norway University. It was a huge meta-analysis done in 2010 and it is robust. It's been replicated. This is the case. And the problem that you have is these women who get into their forties, who always intended to have a family, who realize that they now can't, they go to support groups. And Stephen, the guy that did that documentary went and these women are grieving for families that they never had, uh, which is just brutal. Like to think that you can grieve for something that didn't occur. And uh, he went to this undertaker's uh, funeral parlor in Germany, which has got a birth gap problem already. So you're starting to see more and more single people get to the end of life without any uh, support structure. And he told me the story where the undertaker said for the first time in history, we're doing funerals for these people, both men and women, and nobody's showing up. Mm. There's no one showing to the funerals of these people. There's no one left. And then when they cut the clothes off of them to embalm the body or to dress the body ready for this event, which no one goes to, uh, they find that they've got bruising around their wrists and bruising on their arms. And it seems like in some of the care homes that these people have been staying in, that they've been abused by the carers. Mm. So you have this alone elderly person who doesn't have any family, in the final years of life, they're abused by the people that are supposed to look after them. And then after they die, no one attends their funeral. That's terrible. That's so sad. It's like the most fucking harrowing hairs on the back of your neck style conversation. Yeah. I also think that we're sold um, that popular media in, in, in especially in modern societies, this is where the industrialization aspect comes in, sells having kids or promotes having kids as oppressive, terrible. You can't do fun stuff anymore. It sucks. And so, and that you'll get fine meaning and purpose with your career. So I think that's also plays a big role. Part, the other side of that conversation with population is that people say, well, we have limited resources, right? Well, how can we continue to just grow when we only have so much food, when we have so much oil? With that, I like to point to how many times we've been told that we're going to reach peak oil production. Uh, like we only have so much oil, but innovation actually today, we actually have access to more oil today per person than we did 40 years ago, even though we've been using it the entire time. Same thing with farmland. We use far less land to produce far more food. So the innovation aspect people don't really consider. That's that's also a big part of this conversation too, right? Yes, and everybody always wants to be a Cassandra, me included, right? I'm harping on about the fact that population collapse is something that everybody should be concerned about. There is always going to be like a Nostradamus person pointing at the issue and saying, because it gives them a sense of, uh, importance. But dude, the, the carrying capacity of the earth is, is not a concern. The population collapses. Hey everybody, today's giveaway is the RGB bundle. This is MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. You can win it for free, but you have to enter. Here's how you enter. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section under your comment. We'll say, hey, you're the winner and then you can claim your prize. Also, we have three programs on sale, all three 50% off. MAPS Performance half off, MAPS Aesthetic half off, and MAPS Hit half off. If you're interested in any one of those or all three of those uh, for the 50% off discount, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. I wanted to take a step back because you have a very interesting road to getting to where you're at now. Like, first off, I want to commend you. Um, when you do interviews, you're probably one of the most objective um, and just excellent interviews I've ever heard. You seem you listen very well, very objective. You can you can kind of go on both sides. You have this ability to see through the fog a little bit. How did you get to that place? How did you get to what you do now? So, I was a club promoter for a long time. I ran 
owned one of the biggest events companies in the UK, uh, stood on the front door of about a thousand club nights. Sounds like a natural progression to being a great interviewer. Yeah. <laughs> right. as, you, as you can see, yeah, it's, a, it's the classic uh, intake. So I do that for about a thousand different events that we run over the course of a decade and a half, uh, meet about a million people, um, run this big company and do some reality TV off the back of it. I was a prof professional party boy, right, for a decade and a bit and get toward the end of my 20s after I've done this second reality TV dating show called Love Island. And I kind of had a fatal dose of contrast on that show between the people that were there and the person that I thought I was. And I realized that it actually wasn't necessarily the scene for me. And I had nowhere to hide because cameras were on me 24 hours a day and I had no distractions. And I'd maybe been able to sedate myself with, you know, YouTube and internet and books and bits and pieces. And this really just drove it home. It's like, you're not supposed to be here that much. Was there a moment or was it just the whole thing? So there kind of was, um, it was the show was a gateway drug that kind of made me really start to question, is this what I'm supposed to do? Because that was like the world cup championships of being a party boy, right? <laughs> he, he managed to get on this huge show that's on primetime TV every single night for a month and a half. And I was in there for about a month. Uh, and that was supposed to be everything that society would tell you you're supposed to work toward, right? This is what a young guy that values status and women and renown and resources and all that shit should aspire to do, especially coming from a working class town, working class background. That's exactly what you're supposed to try and do. And I found it lacking, right? Even though I really loved what the work that I'd done in nightlife, and took tons and tons and tons away from it. And I'm very, very proud of what me and my business partner built. There was something missing. And this was a good time, 2016, 17, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, Ben Shapiro, Orlando Botton from the School of Life. So I'm starting to watch and listen to content that makes me think about the direction that I'm going in life and what I really want to do and how I can contribute. And then I just spent a lot of time exposing myself to crushing volumes of content that made me do introspection, realized that I'd been playing a role and a persona for a very long time, uh, started to strip that back. Okay, if I keep on digging and digging and digging, if I'll hit something solid, which was curiosity and a desire to learn and kind of like sort of this nerdy um, angle, which I'd very much kept away because on the front door of a nightclub, I can't talk to people about answers to the Fermi paradox around why there are no aliens out there. <laughs> they want the VIP band and they want to fuck off inside the club, right? Yeah. This isn't the environment in which I could do that. And part of this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because I'm sure that many people would have been responsive to this had I've decided to open up in any case right. about my interest but I didn't have the confidence because I decided that this was the way that people wanted me to be. This was the role I had to play. And also being the leader, I'm sure that you guys feel this as well, as the leader of any sort of company, there is, you begin to put an expectation about what you think other people want you to do mm -hmm. on that. And you start to almost fulfill this role that you've created for yourself. So start the podcast about five years ago, just because I wanted to learn from people. And you roll the clock forward now and it's one of us 600 episodes, Goggins, Peterson, Jocko, Huberman. Yeah, how did you start getting guests at that level? I mean, you've had massive guests on the show, and uh, we know firsthand what it's like to try and get a big name on the show, even when after we've had traction and we're relatively big. So how did you get to the level of getting that kind of guest? I mean, did the, did your show explode overnight? Did you have something that went viral? Like, how did you gain Was all that? Was your club promoting you know, experience? Did that help you? Correct. Oh. So the networking, the background of networking. Oh. Most people have no idea how to network effectively. Hmm. And that was what I'd done for, that was my bread and butter for 15 years. So being able to reach out to people, create relationships, maintain relationships, and then use those to build more. So that was really all that happened. I mean, the show, dude, 90, 96% of my listeners came last year. Spotify gave me the end of year stats. 96% of people wow. joined last year. So you were working for years and years and years, and then it was like... Correct. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that Jack Butcher visualize value um, graph? Yeah. Where it's flat and flat and flat, and there's a little arrow that points to this is pointless, and it's just before the hockey stick yeah. begins. I was at this is pointless for three years, basically. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like, we've done stuff, I think, in a day... In a day, a couple of weeks ago, we did more plays than the entire first three years of the show put together. <laughs> wow. Right. So for anybody out there that is thinking, I'm trying to do this thing, I feel like I've got talent. I genuinely believe that my quality of content is ahead of the interest that it's getting. I just keep going. Chris, did what kept you going during that time? Was it just 
that there was a selfish desire for knowledge and wisdom and learning. So in other words, the first three years when you had no traction Mm. or it seemed like there was nothing happening, Mm. were you just like, okay, but I love this. I love learning. Like what, what can you tell somebody who's like in that period? Because three years, a long time to plug away, invest money and time and energy and see, you know, nothing or, or very little come back in terms of financial success. It didn't feel like work. Okay. That's why I would happily do this for free. Mm. I would happily do it was six o'clock in the UK. It's two o'clock in, in Austin where I am now. I would happily do that every single day for free. If nobody listened like that's, it's what I want to do. And it's very difficult to compete with somebody that's having fun Hmm. because I'm going to outwork everybody else in the room. And it's not even going to feel like work to me for someone that wants to become a great podcaster. They don't have the same predisposition, whatever it is that I have which means that every time that they need to get themselves up and prepare for another guest and sit down and have the conversation, it's going to feel arduous. Whereas for me, I'm actually compelled to do it because I want to, right? It's the the perfect intersection. What is it? Ikigai, what you need to do, uh, sorry, what you want to do, what society needs and what you can be paid for, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's slap bang in the middle. And that's what I've managed to find. So yeah, it didn't feel like work for all that. It can be impressive to say that, oh, you plugged away at something for three years and basically nobody took any notice. So, well, I would still be happily doing that now. Uh, the only difference is now that there's a lot more attention. How it's would awesome. you compare? So how are you as a student, I guess, is uh, where I'm getting at versus like, because this quest for learning that it seems like it might have come a bit later for you or was this always there even going through school? Yeah, always curious, but just kind of hid it away, I think, for a good chunk of time. Again, like the... Too busy being a party boy. Correct. Yeah, yeah dude. You know, if you're running nightclubs and constantly thinking about DJs and all the rest of it. There's only so much time in the day. And it meant that, uh, yeah, that was that curious side of me was a little bit muted, but it's always been there. Mm. And I think a lot of people are like this, man. Like think about the entire industry of podcasting coming out of the, whatever you want to call it, like edutainment sector. It's people that want to learn about, oh, today I'm going to learn about lithium mines and tomorrow I'm going to learn about human DNA for space flight. And then, then I'm going to learn about what it's like to be a professional porn star. Like, why? Well, it's just because we're curious and we want to learn about shit. And I think that uh, following that, following that curiosity is a, a pretty good strategy. It's also a great medium because it's uh, it's long form. So we could have long discussions, whereas that kind of ended for a little while where everything had to be so short. Any any guests that really surprised you that you had on were afterwards you were like, wow, that was different than what I anticipated. Uh, so Goggins recently, um, I had him on. He only did two shows, which was very nice of him to choose me as one of the other ones that wasn't going to be Rogan. And uh, he surprised me because he seems like such an extreme character. You can't believe that this guy is going to be actually that legit in real life. And I was going in there wanting to kind of try and poke holes in, what do you actually spend each day doing? What's your daily routine look like? And why have you decided to go back to not doing any talks? And how come you're only doing two podcasts and blah, blah, blah. However legit and hardcore you think that guy is, it, he's even more legit than that. <laughs> it's terrifying how hardcore that dude is. Mm. And um, that surprised me uh, because I was expecting there to be a at least one chink in the armor and mm. I didn't see anything at all. So very authentic. Correct. Yeah. Anybody that you, that shifted your paradigm, um, and we've had guests on the show where afterwards we all sat down and talked for another hour or two and it just changed our our minds or how we thought about certain things. Um, can you think of a, a time that happened for you where afterwards you were like, okay, I, I am totally different after that interview. All the time, man. I mean, uh, Stephen Shaw, that birth gap thing, the yeah. declining birth rate stuff. I'd known that it was a problem for a while, but I didn't realize just how bad it was. So that really opened my eyes. Uh, a bunch of conversations with evolutionary psychologists about the imbalance in the dating market at the moment. So this mating crisis. Explain is, that. Yeah, that's interesting. I just, I've been hearing <clears throat> stuff about this. This is kind of fascinating to me. Okay. So third rail again. <laughs> um, At the moment, there is a massive reduction in the amount of short-term sex that people are having. And also you have declining marriage rates and uh, family rates, right? Uh, The number of men reporting no sex in the last year has tripled from 8% to 28% from 2008 to 2018. This is men between the ages of 18 and 30. So short-term sex has declined. This has also declined for women as well, but a little bit more for men. For the first time in history, 50.1% of women are childless at 30. And a report from Reuters says that 45% of prime working age women between 22 and 45 will be single and childless by 2040. 
for the first time in history, you have 51% of ch children being born outside of marriage or a civil union. So that's to either single parents or to people that are just in a relationship in the UK. So what that map shows is short-term sex and long-term mating seem to be on the decline, right? We have greater rates of singleness. You think- Which is crazy in a world of Tinder and Correct. Facebook and Instagram. Correct. It's super fascinating that, that that would be declining. How is the ease of access to other partners increasing while what actually occurs in the real world seems to be dropping down? Yeah, and are they connected? Yeah. Correct, yes. So yes, they are. Uh, so that's the- okay, there's something happening here. And I think that everybody, every young single person has an idea that, you know, the dating market seems a little bit different now, very different. All of the advice that my parents can give me doesn't really seem to apply anymore. Mm -hmm. So you would think, what is it that could be happening here? Hypergamy is the tendency for women to date what's called up and across. So on average, women want to date a man who is as educated or more educated than them and as employed or more employed than them. So that's wealth levels, right? This is harkens back to our ancestral roots, which would be that women want a man who has status and resources. Not a problem at all. Why should women try and like settle or not get the best that they can? The issue that you have is that women have been outperforming men in both education and employment for quite a while now. So two women for every one man will complete a four-year US college degree by 2030. Women on average between the ages of one, uh, 21 and 29 earn 1,111 pounds more than men do. So you can see a potential issue here. You have an ever increasing cohort of high performing women that are educated and employed competing for an ever decreasing cohort of ultra high performing men. So this is what I call the tall girl problem. So every guy has a girl friend who is six foot without heels. If you want to wear heels and look nice on a night out, you're stuck dating professional athletes, right? <laughs> because your capacity in terms of height has selected for a very small cohort of men that are taller than you. This is the same, but it's in terms of education and employment. So the ability for women to outperform men, remembering when Title IX came in, which was the affirmative action thing that helped uh, women to get into higher education, the percentage point swing was 13% in favor of men. Now in 2023, it's 15% percentage points in favor of women. We overcorrected. So there was nobody, no one that thought when Title IX came in, that they were going to not only reach parity, but blast straight through it and then overcorrect. Nobody thought that that was going to happen. So again, like you might say, why is it a bad thing that women have got access to education and employment? It's not. Like women needed that for a very long time. The brutal ground truth is that when you match up this increased educational and employment achievement with hypergamy, women who are better educated and better employed reduce down their mating pool. So what's good for their educational and employment achievements is not necessarily good for their dating prospects. And this gets borne out in a ton of data. Uh, relationships where the woman out earns the man are 50% more likely to end in divorce. Relationships where the woman contributes more than 80% of household income are twice as likely to end in divorce. Relationships where the man is not the primary breadwinner, he is 50% more likely to need to use erectile dysfunction medication. Hmm. Women are three times more likely than a man to say that important educational achievement is something that they would judge a partner on. Basically, guys don't care if their partner has got a PhD and earns a hundred grand a year, but women would care more, mm -hmm. right? And this doesn't need to be huge effects. They are quite large effects, but it only needs to be relatively small effects to uh, nudge people's preferences, okay? So we have this problem in terms of short-term and long-term mating. We have this imbalance in terms of female achievement and uh, male achievement. Uh, male labor force participation has declined by 0.1% every month since 1950. It's gone from 87% to 68%. And by 2040, it'll be 65%. 65% labor force participation amongst men. So you can imagine the dynamic. You have this group of turbo chads at the top, right? The sort <laughs> of eight out of tens and above. They have this wealth of options. The guys that are super wealthy, well-educated and tall, usually, they have this big, big, big block of girls that they can run through if they choose to. These women sometimes get used and heartbroken by the guys at the top. That causes them to be bitter and resentful of all men. The group of guys at the bottom, the you know five out of tens and below, are essentially invisible yeah. to most of these women. And angry. But they get the these men aren't worth shit like guy, where are all of the good men at? They believe that they're one of these good men, but they are being sort of tarred with the same brush as the guys that 
used and run through women. So those women retreat into uh, careers and uh, lean into sort of a boss bitch lifestyle. These men retreat into porn and video games. These guys at the top that do have the Turbo Chad access, I don't think it's necessarily even that good for them either. Like having a wealth of options as a man who wants lots of sexual variety doesn't encourage you to be a good man. And many men can't control their sort of uh, desire for sexual variety in the way that they might want to, like in their best moments or whatever. So you end up with both sexes moving further and further apart from each other. The men re that retreat into porn and video games are less uh, attractive potential mates to this group of women and the women that lean into a boss bitch lifestyle make themselves even taller and taller with regards to the tall girl problem. So you end up with a situation in which everybody resents everybody. This You see this online with, you know, MGTOW, Manosphere, Red Pill, Black Pill, incel culture, or on the women's side with boss bitch culture, with pink pill, with female dating strategy. All of these are copes for why can't I find a partner from women that I'm attracted to or from men, one that's attracted to me. Wow. And in, in these uh, apps, these dating apps are showing uh, like that there's a small percentage of men, something like in the single digit percentage of men who are getting all of the matches, all of the conversations, all of the women who want to talk with them. And then the rest are essentially, as you said, invisible. And these dating apps are showing this. Now, historically, evolutionarily speaking, because I, I feel like this is a sounds like a relatively new problem. It's not but a there's, new, the there, monogamy argument. Right, because there's arguments that we created monogamy or monogamy, although now in, in every su successful society, this is what's practiced. But for a lot of human history, that wasn't the case. And you had the man with the resources and the military and the harem. And then you had the, you know, the peasants and they just, they just didn't have accessible women. And so the argument is that we created monogamy and it was a way to keep us peaceful and not killing each other and all that stuff. So it's like the, we've now this kind of natural tendency where all the women want these few men and all these other guys are invisible. Now it seems like we've amplified that with technology and accessibility. And that's what we're kind of seeing right now. Is it that guys are just giving up and that women are working harder? Is that part of it or is it more than that? There's an awful lot going on. So Richard Reeves, guy that wrote Of Boys and Men, really great book, short read. Everybody should check it out if they're interested in this. And he talks about the structural problems. Uh, men are dropping out of education, employment, and family life. Uh, why it's happening, it seems like girls mature more quickly than boys. Everyone knows that. They hit puberty earlier than boys. Uh, but there's other things. They're on average more conscientious, which means that when it comes to sitting down and doing homework, they're better. More boys have got ADD. More boys are restless and boisterous when it comes to class. That doesn't engender a very successful uh, like education outcome mm. for guys. Uh, there are four times as many female fighter pilots in the U.S. Air Force as there are male kindergarten teachers by percentage in the U.S. <laughs> Two percent of kindergarten teachers are men. Eight percent of fighter pilots are female. I'm happy to have a discussion about whether there should be more female fighter pilots in the U.S., but there absolutely needs to be more male kindergarten teachers because they understand how to deal with boisterous boys, right? Oh, I see. So the monogamy argument is an interesting one. Uh, it seems to me that almost all human histories, uh, human civilizations throughout history ancestrally were monogamish, right? So this like polygyny argument really only begins to make sense once you've got agricultural revolution because no one man can accumulate sufficient resources to be able to look after more than just him and his local family. So for anybody that says you do have this like huge polygyny thing going on and everyone's a, Geng everyone's a wannabe Genghis Khan, no, no, mm -hmm. not up until 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And you can tell by the, uh, there's some genetic records, there's some anthropological data that suggests that it's just not the case. It's not, it, most of human history was monogamish. Serial monogamy, perhaps, but it wasn't this polygyny where it's one man with an entire harem of women. Because how would you, in a normal local tribe, if you don't have tons and tons of resources, how are you not going to stop all of the other men just tearing you apart? Mm -hmm. And this is a problem called young male syndrome. So this is, we've spoken about individual happiness and stuff. We probably need to justify why people need to get into a relationship at all. We can do that in a bit. But um, societal stability is something to be concerned about. If you have a ton of men who are not bought in to the local society, why should they behave? Why shouldn't they cause havoc? If they've not got a partner and they've not got kids, their testosterone is higher because getting into a relationship drops testosterone and then having kids drops it again, which reduces risk-taking behavior. Why shouldn't they just 
go around and push over granny and set buildings on fire and stuff. They've got nothing else to do. And this has happened throughout history. Portugal in the 1700s, they actually shipped off all of the sons that weren't the first son. The first son got married off and the rest of them were put on galleon ships and they got to explore the new world. What they were doing was they were outsourcing this potential, these roving bands of like future miscreants and they were just exporting them out of the out of the country. Um, so young male syndrome is this uh, situation in which a proliferation of childless, sexless young men cause havoc for society. Given that we've got ever increasing rates of sexlessness amongst young men and young people generally, where is all of the rioting? Like that's a valid question. You know, incel killings for all that a lot of the killings that do occur, especially mass shootings, do come from young lonely men. There's nowhere near it. It hasn't tripled in the last ten years, right. right? So why is it not going up in line? And this is a theory that I've come up with, which is the male sedation hypothesis. So it's my belief that men are being sedated out of this state of seeking and reproductive behavior through porn and video games. I think that video games gives them the uh, team bonding, goal seeking, forward oriented satisfaction that they need. And I think that porn is giving them a very, very, very slight titrated dose. Careful, you, you're you touching a third rail that it wasn't a third rail that long ago. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we talked we talked about video games the other day. And oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of guys with this back, backlash don't, that. don't come after their yeah, video games. You know, the, the pornography conversation is interesting because this is relatively new. I mean, pornography has existed for a long time, but not its access. I make the joke on the podcast all the time that, you know, when we, were, we grew up in the 90s, if you had a dirty magazine in the 90s, you could literally trade... Cool. Uh, you could trade it for some kid's bike. That's how hard it was to come by. And now it's so accessible. Um, it's interesting. Have you interviewed anybody to talk about the impacts of pornography on men and society and what that could potentially do to us? Yes. I've had a, co a couple of conversations that actually contradict each other. So uh, mm. Dr. David Lay is very anti-porn panic. And I need to dig into a lot more of what he talked about. He said that people are overblowing the concern when it comes to porn. Really? Yeah, yeah, which is uh, the first guy that I've ever heard to talk about this. Um, but he's deep in the research. On average, I think that porn is a pretty destructive force for men. And the main reason that I think it is, is that guys who are in relationships and use porn are less likely to have sex with their partner, right? So you're less likely to satisfy your partner because you're able to satisfy yourself aside from that. Downstream from that, your partner may start to wonder and worry about why are we not having as much sex. If you're single, it's going to promote you to go out and actually get laid less. Like if the only way that you can get sex is by finding another woman, you're going to be very motivated to go out and find that woman. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can get your rocks off at home on your own, then that's not going to be the case. Andrew Huberman said to me on a really great episode that people should check out about how porn watching can train people to become aroused when they're watching somebody else have sex, but that doesn't necessarily translate over into when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody in the oh, real world. Man. So you can actually, there is a, a potential concern that you could neurologically program yourself to become a voyeur. And that is a pretty big concern. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are happening as well with like young kids that learn about sex through porn and then have super skewed perspectives of what sex is supposed to be, how you're supposed to do it, et cetera, et cetera. This is, I guess, more of a concern for women about how men treat them. But like, if you're a guy, you want to treat a woman well, right? You don't want to be doing something that she's going to absolutely detest or or hurt her. So um, yeah, the porn panic thing. When it comes to video games, again, I, I don't know I haven't seen the data on this. I do need to speak to some like gaming addiction people. However, it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, the question still remains, if young men aren't having that much sex, where is all of the up, uh, the unrest, right? Yeah, it manifests online in forums and stuff like that, but it's not happening in the real world and it should be so prolific. This isn't me like campaigning for, go out there and burn down your local fucking CVS. But something's happening. And the two things that men would typically want would be camaraderie, goal seeking, and reproduction. Look, when when I was younger, which wasn't that long ago, um, if you were at home by yourself, you there was nothing to do. You had nothing to do. Now it's hard. I have kids, so I have two teenagers, and I also have two real, you know, much younger ones. And and anybody who has kids now will tell you, look, when I was a kid, if you got punished, you were sent to your room. Now it's almost the reverse. 
It's like get off all your you electronics. Punished, you yeah. gotta go yeah, outside. Go out. outside and I'm not even joking. <laughs> Stand on that grass. Yeah. Yeah. Stand on that fucking door. grass. <laughs> it's true. It it's true. so true. It's like get off your stuff, and they're like, I don't know what to do. Go outside. There's nothing to do outside. Yep. So I I think I agree kind of with what you're saying. This kind of all speaks to, in my opinion, this bigger thing, which is we seem to be more connected. It's easier to talk to people. It's easier to meet people. Yet there seems to be this epidemic of loneliness. Correct. And that seems to be across the board, especially with older people, but across the board where we're more anxious, more depressed, and more lonely than ever before. What have you what have you read about this? It's terrifying, man. I mean, the most common answer to the question, how many friends do you have that you could call on in an emergency is zero. That's the most common answer. That's not the average or the mean, but it's the most common answer. Wow. That's fucking terrifying. Wow. Right? In a world where we are more connected than ever before, people are feeling more alone. Being lonely is as bad for your health as smoking a pack of 10 cigarettes every single day. People that are alone have quicker onset of dementia. They have quicker neurological decline. Their health span is shorter. Their lifespan is shorter. The problem is everybody, as far as I can see, and this is the sedation hypothesis, is being sedated out of things that are good for them. What is convenient is not always what's good for you. In the same way as a child might always want to have ice cream for dinner, they need to be told that they can't. Even though they want it, it's not necessarily what's good for them. But when you create a world where convenience is paramount, when you can, you know, Uber eats a Michelin star meal to the couch that you Amazon primed yesterday to be built by some guy that you paid for on TaskRabbit yep. to then watch Netflix from the comfort of your home. I, all of this is constrained. Oh my God, you just described my last Saturday right there. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's true though. You know, what I think is interesting about this conversation is, is and how powerful all these things are is how much it can even creep into someone's life who's aware of it. Correct. I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time and it's like, man, it's, it's wild to me how, how easily you can get kind of roped into we're such, it. So, we're social creatures at the, at the very least. Um, you have to be around people. In fact, it's, it's been, it's been acknowledged as a uh, cruel um, form of punishment that you to isolate someone like Correct. you capture a prisoner in war. It's the worst thing that you could do to them is to put them alone. You Correct. know, that's considered cruel and unusual punishment. And in major world countries have said, we will not do that if we go to war to each other's, you know, captured uh, to, to captured enemies. So it's, it's pretty wild. I did read that talking with people online gives you the same dopamine as meeting them in person. But what you lack is the oxytocin. Mm. So you get the dopamine, which is the driver, but you lack the oxytocin. So it's like, it's like the, you, you get a drug. It's like, it's like getting high from a drug versus getting high from doing something physical yep. and active. The work isn't there and the meaning isn't there. And so it's just a hit of dopamine. So in essence, it's, uh, it is what you're saying. Sedating, I think is the best word. It's like, we're, we're satisfying the driver. So we'll lose the driver, yep. but we're not getting what we really need. And Correct. without the driver, we'll never get what we really need. Yeah. And with that titrated dose, it's enough to just keep people comfortably numb, but it's not enough to actually motivate them to go and do something. So I learned about this uh, concept called the region beta paradox last year. And the region beta paradox, imagine that if you were going to go somewhere, you would walk if it was less than a mile. Oh, I just shared this with you guys. Yeah, but you would this. drive if it was a mile or greater, right? Paradoxically, what that means is that you would drive somewhere, drive two miles quicker than you would walk one mile. Now, the problem that you have is that if people can get themselves into a situation where things aren't quite that bad, that it'll activate them to get out the bottom, they're comfortably numb. They're in this region mm -hmm. beta in the middle. So you could imagine someone that's in a relationship, it's not abusive, it's not that bad, but it doesn't fire them up. They've probably settled. Or someone lives in an apartment where the landlord isn't that much of a dick, but there's maybe a bit of mold and maybe it's a bit expensive and it's a rough area of town. All of these people would actually be better off if their situations were worse because it would motivate them to do something about it and come out of the bottom. If your situation is good, fantastic, good for you. If your situation is bad, okay, you're going to do something to change it. If your situation is just about passable, mm. this is how you end up being comfortably numb. And that's the sedation in the middle. And I think that a lot of people, whether they know it or not, they just feel like life is kind of here. It's just this sort of gray, vanilla, pumped into them kind of dopamine flex up and down throughout the day. They don't really know what's going on. They're not super connected to the things around them. They don't feel awe. They don't feel dread. They don't feel a massive amount of fear, but they don't feel a massive amount of joy. 
and this is the world that's being created at the moment. I, do, I mean, this is like fucking super black pilled stuff, right? Like, it's not, this, I'm not exactly being the most positive yeah. of, of vibes so far. <laughs> However, here's the fucking thing that I would say in order to transcend your programming, you have to become aware of it. And the choice that you have when it comes to happiness in life is between becoming aware of your mental afflictions or the discomfort of becoming ruled by them. The only way that you can get past this stuff, it is, we are in uncharted territory here, folks. No one has been here before. The ease of access to dopamine, the lack of connection between humans, no one's been here before. In order for you to deal with this problem, you have to first become aware of it. 100%. What you're what you're talking about right now is one of the things or one of the main reasons that we attribute to the rise in the Spartan races and these ops, these things were and uh, you see a lot of these guys online now that are selling these groups where they go, you know, guys are, you know, young men are paying thousands of dollars to get, you know, beat up for Punched a week in the face yeah. and basically like Navy SEAL selection yes. type yes. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's and so this is what we attribute to that is that it, it, we have this desire for struggle and to go through these things and no everyone I, I agree with you is at this kind of yeah even well, think about the fucking proliferation of uh ice tubs yeah. what are you we doing have one here yeah. yeah but what are you what are you doing you're saying my life is so comfortable yep yeah day to day that i have to go out of my way to buy a five thousand dollar custom piece of equipment yeah. in order to be able to artificially inject some difficulty into my existence that's what's happening. Yeah. Your life has become so comfortable and convenient that you have to create a room in which heavy things are attached to a long, thin thing, and then you have to pick it up and put it down because you have to pick up and put down nothing else in your life. That's what's happening. People are artificially re-engineering the stuff that you would have naturally done as a course throughout your entire day, and they're having to do it in little blocks. I mean, I've seen this with the creation of gyms and getting rid of a lot of manual labor and hard tasks. I mean, isn't this where it's just going to get uh, more crazy with AI and everything solving all these other problems of struggle? So where do you see us being able to address this in another form? It's fucking difficult, man. I mean, the AI thing is terrifying. You, hey, are you going down the rabbit hole of chat GBT yet? Yes. Uh, that's yeah. been like a, Have you guys spoken about it much? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been the hot topic for much. like the last couple yeah. months, man. We've okay. Been well, yeah, we, we, we've, we, I've, I've called it a genie. It's like at some point, everyone's going to have a genie and be able to get whatever they want. That's terrifying. I mean, if you think that social media at the moment is bad, wait until almost all of it is not only driven to you by algorithms that know exactly what to give you, but it's written by algorithms that know exactly what to say. Within the next 10 years, over 90% of content that's produced on the internet won't be even made by humans. At least at the moment when you read something that's either useless or interesting and you regret reading it afterwards, at least you know that someone somewhere wrote it. But imagine when it's become automated. Imagine when the content that you read on the internet has become automated. And then imagine when they can deep fake videos of people. So I was with Tom Bilyeu yesterday. They're training an equivalent of chat GPT on every conversation that he's ever had, on everything that he's ever written, so that you can have a permanent virtual avatar of Tom in the metaverse that you can go and have a conversation with at all times. And it'll accurately tell you what Tom is. So I'm like, hang on, if it's more you than you are, or if it knows everything that you've ever said, like, what use are you now? Mm -hmm. What what does that even mean to be you? If I can have a permanent 24-7, unlimitedly scalable, every single person that wants to have a podcast, hey, come and have it, come and do a podcast with Chris. Come and do a podcast with virtual Chris, Chris AI. Come and do that. Fucking terrifying. Yeah. Now, there's an article from a friend that I want everybody to go and check out. It's by uh, Gwinda Bogle on uh, Substack, gowinda.substack.com, and it's about TikTok. So I uh, pulled up a oh, couple Oh, I, I think I saw this. Yeah, it's fucking terrifying. I read half of it and I had to stop. <laughs> it's pretty bad. So uh, in a survey asking American and Chinese children what job they wanted most, the top answer amongst Chinese kids was astronaut. Yeah. And the top answer amongst American kids was influencer. There is a substantial body of research showing a strong association between smartphone addiction, shrinkage of the brain's gray matter, and digital dementia an umbrella term for the onset of anxiety and depression and the de deterioration of memory, attention span, self-esteem, and impulse control, the last of which increases addiction. Indeed, many habitual TikTokers can already be found complaining on websites like Reddit about their loss of mental ability, a phenomenon that's come to be known as TikTok brain. Wow. If the signs are becoming apparent already, imagine what TikTok addiction will have done to a new developing brains a generation from now. TikTok's capacity to both stupefy people acutely 
by encouraging idiotic behavior, like getting people to drink bleach out of a toilet, which yeah, actually yeah. happened to girls. Eat pods. Correct. Yeah, which g- gave people brain damage. Uh, so you've got acute stupidity, and then you've got chronic stupidity through atrophying the brain. This should prompt consideration of its potential use as a new kind of weapon, one that seeks to neutralize enemies, not by inflicting plain, pain and terror, but by inflicting pleasure. Yeah. Last month, FBI Director Christopher Wray warned that TikTok is controlled by a Chinese government that could use it for influence operations. So how likely is it that one such influence operation might include addicting young Westerners to a mind-numbing content to create a generation of nincompoops? It's happening. Well, universities, we, we there's already, how many universities are already banning it now, right? UT Austin's banned it on campus. Yeah, yeah we, there's, we, there's a handful. We right? would use it. Our CIA would use it. So of course they're going to use it yeah. on us. You know, what this, this, you know what this makes me think is two things. One is that we think we know what we want, but we really don't know what the hell that we want. And so we're getting everything that we want, but it's not really what we need. And then two is humans fundamentally don't understand that there's a trade. They think if they get this thing that there's no potential trade. So I'll give you an example. If you look at the statistics on kids today, they're doing, they're le- they're, they're having less unprotected sex, less sex. They're doing less drugs. They're doing having less risky behavior. That's great. But what's on the other end of that is more anxiety and more depression, more loneliness, less connection, right? So we tend to forget that or not realize that there's a trade. Like, uh, you know, we work in the health space, right? Um, We don't have to break break our backs working. uh, So it's not hard physical labor. We can, uh, you know, nobody starves anymore. Food is really accessible and easy. And we've engineered to make it super desirable and tasty. All sounds great, except on the other end of that is obesity, and chronic health problems. So it's it's as if we, it's like a lesson we have to keep learning. We want this thing and we don't realize that when we get it, there's a trade-off. And the trade-off to all of this, because look, I can stay in my house alone and I definitely won't get into a car accident, for sure. Or I can get my car and try and drive around and meet people and my car accident risk sky, skyrockets in comparison. So there's always going to be a trade. And the trade is the tough part. We don't realize that. We think it's, it's this is better, so it's better. But there's a trade. And right now we're experiencing the other end of, of what we're getting. And the other end is loneliness, anxiety, depression, or listless. Yeah. You know? Now, you made earlier you brought something up. You said we're comfortable enough that we don't want to make any change. So we got to get worse. Maybe that's the good thing. Maybe we're getting to the point where it's worse. Like, for example, there's groups. We talked about pornography earlier. There's groups on, on the internet of guys that do, it's like no fap. Like, oh, we avoid, that happened spontaneously from young men who saw what pornography was doing to them. And they all decided themselves. This was not government controlled. Their school didn't do it. It wasn't their parents. It was them saying, I'm going to quit porn. One of the problems that you have with NoFap is that people become obsessed about fapping. (laughs) You know, <laughs> yeah. They do. Like, so NoFap is, is as obsessive around fapping as someone that is pathologically touching themselves. Like they're constantly thinking about it. And I've not been a part of the NoFap community, but Hamza, who's a good mate, who kind of taps into this Gen Z uh, young men's space, says that there are huge, huge swaths of guys that feel completely disgusted to themselves because they touch their penis. Like if you break your fap streak, you just feel like a total piece of shit. Too extreme. You're totally worthless. So classic overcorrection. Correct. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. It's this binary thinking. Nothing can be in the gray area. But dude, I mean, you know, would I rather somebody obsess over uh, their personal development and fear touching their penis compared with spending two hours a day watching porn? Fucking hell. I mean, that's a pretty difficult, like both of them sound like a kind of hell to me. Um, So yeah, it's a difficult one. And then when you think about how super convenient life has become for everybody, it doesn't surprise me that people aren't bothering to go out. I mean, you know, talk about another overcorrection. Uh, Me Too, what it did downstream from that, which was a needed policy to bring powerful men to account for the way that they were using power to leverage uh, women into doing things that they didn't want sexually. But now there are huge, huge numbers of young men that are so terrified to go up to a girl in the gym or in a bar that nobody is even approaching anyone. 86% of women say that they want their male partner to make the first move. But a huge cohort of men are so terrified of being called a creep. I was out in London a little while ago with a friend 
young guy, successful dude, big on YouTube. And uh, we'd finished having dinner and he was boring me. And there was a group of girls over the far side. And I was like, hey man, why, why, why don't we go over and say hello to that group of girls? And he looked at me like I'd suggested that we go over and like strangle them and put them into a body bag. He's like, <laughs> you're not being serious. I was like, yeah. He's like, dude, I've been told never ever to approach a girl in a club for any reason at all. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Overcorrection yet again. And that's the thing, like, I, anybody on the internet that wants to kind of get a rallying cry is like, um, make women feel safe. Like that's an easy uh, cause to get behind, right? But also like make women feel safe and have some men approach them that they're attracted to so maybe they can get into a relationship. Like <laughs> blending those two worlds together is actually kind of difficult. Oh. It's very difficult where like it doesn't fit into a tweet. No. You ever yeah. seen that skit with Tom Brady? I think it was on SNL. I don't remember, but uh, it was like, this is sexual harassment. And it's, it's like an attractive guy. And he's like, yeah. hey, you know, you look pretty today. She's like, oh my God. And then Tom Brady shows up and he like smacks her on the butt. And she's like, ooh, you know, yep. it was just this hilarious skit that kind of showed yep. the challenge with it. And obviously it's, it's comedy, so it's a little extreme, but- Interesting. So do you see light at the end of the tunnel? Because I do also see people who through technology, you mentioned a few people that have been on your show that I don't think would have gotten traction without um, the internet, without podcasts. For example, Jordan Peterson wouldn't have gotten any traction and he's done some good stuff. Um, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Because I also, on the other hand, see people who are saying stuff like you're saying, listening to your show, who are reaching out and saying, you know what? I do need challenge. I do need struggle. Wow. This, maybe I do need to go make things hard for myself or go meet people or try to grow. Like, what does that look like to you? The internet has created both good and bad things. And what we're trying to do is create a world in which we can have all of the good without any of the bad. That's what we're working toward. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's helped people that help people reach those people, you know, the humans of the world, a guy that essentially came out of this sort of dusty old lab in Stanford and within the space of whatever, two or three years, he's probably the number one health and fitness podcast in the world, mm -hmm. just relaying an endless list of interesting shit that people can use to make their lives better. That wouldn't be facilitated without the internet. Can you have both the good and the bad? That's the the balance that everybody is trying to strike at the moment. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think, um, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets a lot better, but I do see light at the end. The problem is historically, the optimistic view is that things happen and travel so fast now that these overcorrections seem to be they crazier, and screwed, but they get balanced faster too. That's my, so I feel like, mm. I mean, even I, I know we haven't, we haven't touched this third rail yet either, but I mean, I feel like I, I'm starting to see a rise in religion again, where I felt like just a decade ago, we were on the complete opposite track. So. What's that, um, what's that denomination of Christianity that's all done in Latin? Oh, well, uh, there's a, there's a form of Catholicism that's done. What's that one called? I think, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, uh, Shea LeBeau, I think was talking about going to mass where it's all done. I mean, it, it'll definitely be the same one. So it's the fastest growing uh, sect it's, or whatever, like subversion of Christianity. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and the whole service is done in Latin. Yes. Yeah. Shia LeBeau talked about he that. He talked about it and he talked about, um, and, and I, it makes sense as to why it would be appealing. It's like the more things seem structureless and crazy, the more we're going to want the structure and the rules Correct. and the ritual. So to me, that seems quite obvious. Yeah. It's so strange, man. I mean, think about how uh, idealistic and progressive and, and, and smart and clever and rational and scientific, it seemed 20 years ago to listen to Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris just yeah. tear down some religious zealot that didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And then you roll the clock forward a little bit now and Douglas Murray, who was a good friend, who wrote a book that was very critical of a bunch of different religions, then wrote a book called The Madness of Crowds that was fundamentally based on the collapse of grand narratives. Mm. His concern was that there are no more grand narratives that bind us all together as a country. Mm. And it's like, okay, how much baby has been thrown out with the bathwater here? Like it's really, really evident. Religion independently arose all over the world, right? Why? Well, it has to serve some sort of adaptive purpose. It has to be useful to people. And I also mean, wouldn't have lasted that many years. Precisely. But I mean, think about the fucking rise of stoicism, man. Stoicism is modern secular religion for people that don't want to have to believe in a higher power. Yeah. So mm -hmm. true. Right. Yoga is exactly the same thing. 
uh, psychedelic, psychedelic culture, like the religion of Austin, where I'm from, um, <laughs> is, is exactly, Alaska. is exactly, like, precisely, you know, uh, there was a cool meme I saw the other day that said, uh, men will literally fly to Colombia to drink Amazonian mud rather than go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that was There's one of the, so when we, that. so it's so funny you touched on that and it's funny that you're pointing out Austin because that was where we were when, when our experience of this was, uh, you know, almost what, seven, seven years ago when we started to get connected to more influential people in the fitness space. And there's this big movement in the fitness space around the ayahuasca and the yep. psychedelics and everything like that. And it's from a kid who grew up in a very religious home. It's just, to me, it's just religion packaged differently. Correct. It, it's, yeah. it feels the exact same way when you're around all of it, but it's interesting. It's like, uh, we, we have this desire we're, we're searching for it. So if, whether you're a, you know, you're, you believe in a higher power or you, want to say you're atheist, you still, ha we still have this natural thing that we gravitate. If you feel more comfortable saying crystals and mother ayahuasca, but it's in the universe, yeah, in the universe. Correct. Yeah. Same, I mean, same even thing. roll it forward into the fitness world, right? Like CrossFit, CrossFit, you know, you'll have like sermon Sundays is a non-ironic type of workout that a bunch yep. of places do Friday night lights. What is it? It's ritualistic. You know, you have the guy that stood at the front that's preparing what's going to go on. You have reverence, you have silence, you have mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Like people are repurposing this kind of structure into a bunch of different ways. Um, what is, what is your personal journey been like for that? Or did you grow up religious? Do you, do you believe in God? Where, where are you at with that? And how is that, how's your journey been like that? Very secular upbringing. Um, the Northeast of the UK, uh, the UK in general is ahead of America in terms of being non-religious. So, um, I really hesitate to use the spiritual, but not religious crowd. However, um, I'm interested, I'm open to the idea that there might be more going on than I can see with my own two eyes but I don't have any proof for it yet. So tell me how that has, how's that, how that's come to be for you. Cause if you come from a place that is very secular, I'm, I'm imagining that you probably would have claimed that you were atheist in your younger years. Mm. And now you're a little more open to that. So where, where did that transition happen for you? That would probably be about correct. Um, I think I don't have, so atheist is having an active belief that there is no God. Right. right. right? And the difference between that and agnostic is I don't know. There's this line from um, Angels and Demons by Dan Brown and Tom Hanks is in the movie and he's speaking to Ewan McGregor, who's the acting camera lingo, and he wants to get into the Vatican archives. He wants to get down there to find something that Da Vinci wrote or Michelangelo or whatever, because it's going to tell him where the next clue is. And he's trying to convince Ewan McGregor's character to let him down there. And the camera lingo turns to him and he says, do you believe, Professor? And he gives some like wishy-washy wanky answer where he's trying to evade what's said. He said, I didn't ask you that. I asked if you believed. And Tom Hanks turns and looks straight at Ewan McGregor and he goes, faith is a gift that I'm yet to be given. And I, I fucking love that line. Mm. I absolutely love that line. I don't think that most people who are convinced of a, a higher power of religion, of the ideology that's behind it would discount it, especially not now, especially when, when we have this uh, lack of meaning, this dearth of, of existential crisis and stuff like that. I think people would be pretty happy to accept that. Yeah. I think yeah. that would be something that would be pretty cool for them. But there is a, this sort of scientism rationalist mm -hmm. approach is creating a very high bar for people to have this proved to them. So for me, my mum is a, a Reiki master of 20 years. So, she you know, she spent a long, long time doing distant healing, crystals, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I enjoy hearing her talk through her stuff. I don't know how much of that I fully subscribe to, but I enjoy the process of it. I enjoy hearing her talk with reverence about the practices that she goes through and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, I was never like a, a card carrying atheist. I thought it was cool to be like all cynical and kind of staunch and rational and stuff. I thought that that it was a bit of intellectual posturing probably that, ah, oh, this seems like I'm real rational and you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to believe with these hokey kind of stories about fucking. Which is probably why you were attracted to like a Sam Harris type of podcaster. Yeah, yeah. Although even with Sam, dude, the stuff that I love to do with him was to do with the nature of your own mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got this amazing talk uh, called death in the present moment. It's an hour long. It's like 12 years old uh, and people should go and check it out on YouTube after they've, finished with this podcast. It's just outstanding. He just explains that 
a lot of your life is going to be spent waiting for the next moment to come. And when that moment finally comes, you'll realize that it was the moment ready for your death. People are always looking past the present moment's shoulder, just peering past it to see what's coming next. Hmm. And you will realize when someone that you care about dies or you get sick or someone close to you gets sick, that you wasted your time thinking and worrying about things that ultimately didn't make any difference to you. And we all know that this is coming. We are all able to prepare ourselves for this to happen. Yeah. And yet people don't decide to fix it. So that for me was like where Sam really came into his own. But with the religion thing, man, I'm I'm perfectly open and I, I've been meaning to go to one of these Latin mass things that a bunch of different friends that I play pickleball with go to and they've been singing the praises of it in Latin. And uh, yeah, I think that it's something that more and more people are going to lean into now. Yeah, atheists are, real atheists are actually closer to believing in God than um, people who just don't think about it at all. Because a real atheist is constantly thinking about I was an atheist for a long time. And it was it's something that I pondered and thought about. And that's how I got to that point. Think about how that relates to NoFap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, just extreme. Correct. It's the obsession. It's the inversion of the obsession. Mm -hmm. But it brought me, it made, because I thought about it, I was doing more than a lot of people, which is they don't think about it at all. Correct. Um, What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? You know, wisdom's in the title of your podcast. You talk about that. What is what is wisdom? Wisdom would be knowledge applied for me. So a good definition of wisdom would be something like understanding the outcomes of your actions, being able to accurately predict what's going to happen based on what you do. Knowledge would simply be an understanding of the actions and what they mean. Hmm. And I think trying to understand myself and the world around me was a question that I asked myself a lot. You know, guys, I call it the manopause. Guys get toward the end of their twenties and they're like, fucking, what, like, why, what, what's going on here? All of the values, all the things that I thought and was told I should really take pride in throughout most of my twenties, they just really don't seem to be serving me. And they change their training style. Like how many guys that are on a push pull leg split or like five by five or like German volume training or whatever, doing a bro thing up until 25, 26, 27. And then they go, do you know what it is, man? I can't touch my toes and I get out of breath going up a set of stairs. I really should start doing yoga or CrossFit or fighting or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu yeah. or whatever. And it's just this period. That was the fitness menopause that then transcended into the menopause <laughs> for me. Um, <clears throat> and I think that as that gets thrown up in the air, you become a little bit more aware of like, is this really what I want to be doing? Does Is the peak of my life to get a bag in with the boys on a weekend. Like, is that really what I want to do? And wisdom for me is about understanding yourself and the world around you, understanding how your actions will have outcomes in the real world. Knowledge, you need to spend that time uh, absorbing it. But I mean, everybody has a friend that's smart, but not wise, right? Everybody has a friend that's smart, but not wise. We're going to have a lot more of them with chat GBT in the direction of virtual, the virtual oh, people that a are smart, lot of wise. people that have all the answers. Yes. You know saying, but we'll, laugh well that would listen. be, that would be uh, stupid, but not wise. Right. I don't think they're even going to be smart. Right. Um, By extension. I mean, if you yeah. consider your chat GPT or AI as an extension of you, you'll have all the knowledge you want, but zero wisdom and zero knowledge. Yeah. 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 You, at least in yourself. I mean, we, I was on the plane uh, coming over here last night and I was sat next to this guy and we were trying to remember a, a movie that uh, Bruce Willis had been in. And I caught myself saying, fucking, what was that movie? It was, was it Unbreakable or Glass? The one where he was with Samuel L. Jackson and the guy had like real brittle yeah, bones. Yeah, Unbreakable. Unbreakable. Thank you. Um, but I was like, what the fuck's that? What the fuck's the movie called? And I was like, this is why we need Wi-Fi. And I'm like, oh, you just outsourced part of your brain <laughs> to the internet. Yeah. How many like, phone numbers do you remember? None. I, I can remember my parents' home phone number, which is just as well that they never moved. Uh and I can remember mine and I can remember my old business partners. And the only reason for that is because the number of times that he's, I've hit voicemail with him and I can only say it to myself if I go like, oh, double seven, nine, five, three, double eight. Like I need yeah. to fucking do it in yeah. the cadence that the lady on the fucking phone did. Um, but yeah, I, the wisdom thing, people want answers. They want to understand how to live a good life, what it is that they should focus on. And that was the main reason that I started my show. And that was the reason that every time I sit down with the Jordan Peterson or whatever, I've had him on the show twice and he's become a good friend. 
every time I speak to him, I don't want to talk about culture war stuff. I don't want to talk about Sports Illustrated models. I don't want to talk about like Canada, Justin Trudeau's new overreach of whatever it is. That's in, I'm sure that they're important conversations for Jordan to have in his own time. I want him to help me deal with the existential weight of existing because that was the problem mm. that I struggled with toward the end of my twenties. So for me, getting that knowledge, putting it into practice, understanding your outcomes, understanding yourself and the world around you, wisdom. So being as, um, I guess, aware as you are, cause you obviously are very aware. Um, how was the last few years for you looking at the, just how people behave, the behaviors, the fears, the, you know, just were you Good like, thing. like, like for me looking at the whole thing and going through it, I just couldn't believe the insanity and how crazy it got. Were you in the same position? Were you going through it going, okay, is this at some point people are gonna be like, that's enough. Or were you just like, well, it's human behavior. It's probably gonna get much worse. <sighs> Good question. So I really didn't get too emotionally invested in any of what happened between 2020 and now. Um, at least with regards to the response to the pandemic. Uh, it was the first time in my adult life that I had a stable sleep and wake pattern <laughs> ever, right? Because I was working until three or four in the morning, two or three nights a week oh, I see. for forever. So I got to go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? So I used the pandemic probably quite selfishly um, to just better myself. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time doing meditation, doing reading, growing the show. I stepped up the show from two a week to three a week, which I've now maintained, even though the pandemic is over. I figured that people would be more alone or whatever. And even my like poultry audience that I had at the time, I was like, look, I, I can I can do something to help people. But I really quite fortunately managed to avoid having my brain turned inside out by anything that was going on. I. Sure, I didn't want to be told by Boris Johnson three days before Christmas that I wasn't supposed to go home to see my parents, right? I'd ruptured my Achilles. I had a full Achilles detachment uh, during yeah. that summer. So I was already in like a bit of a, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, down place. I didn't want to hear that, but I, I was really, really happy with how I didn't let those things get to me. Now, some people perhaps rightly might say, well, that's because you didn't like put your money where your mouth is and you didn't stand for something or whatever. It's like, I did other stuff. I supported people with interesting conversations that distracted them away from it. There were enough people talking about that over the last few years. They didn't need another person going, like putting my completely uneducated, completely unprofessional opinion in, just like horse shitting my way through sure. like hot takes to do with stuff. I wasn't prepared to put the work in to get myself to the requisite amount of knowledge to be able to have an opinion that I would feel comfortable standing behind. If only like, everybody thought like that. You actually did the right thing. <laughs> yeah, I was you say, focused only, on making yourself better. Yeah. If everybody I did mean, that's, that. Yeah, what Jordan Peterson would say, right? You cleaned your own room. Yeah. So telling everybody else what they need to do. Douglas Murray, I was in New York with him last year and he was saying to me, uh, um, I, I mentioned why he hadn't really commented on, on COVID all that much. And we're sat there, it's like two in the morning in uh, New York and he's drinking a Manhattan. He said, you know what it is, Christopher? I did something which is very rare in the online world now, which is not to contribute to something which I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, fuck yeah. Like one of the problems that we have in the modern world with hot takes coming from everybody and with this ubiquity of uh, ease of access to give opinions is that everybody believes that they're supposed to have an opinion on everything. It's like, bro, I really, really... Um, love the way that you can talk about personal development and mindset. I don't respect or care about your opinion on Ukraine, yeah. right? Why, what, what makes you think like, is it that you're not supposed to have an opinion on stuff? No, obviously not. But you, like, let's leave it to the global policy experts, right? Let's leave it to the people that understand international relations and like cold war warfare and game theory and sh systems theory and shit like that. Like that's for them to do. You can have your little hot take or whatever, but don't make it your new hill to die on yeah. unless you're, you're prepared to go through all of the requisite work to get there. But the problem that you have is people very much are their opinions now, right? Yeah. Like in a world where your words are more important than your deeds because nobody sees your deeds, but everybody sees your words, you are your opinions. The problem is that there's precious few original thinkers in the world. So what happens is, a large cohort of people repurpose opinions from whoever their favorite thought leader is. So you could argue that the culture war like is, largely, <laughs> is largely two armies yeah. of NPCs being ventriloquized by a handful of original thinkers, right? 
you have these guys at the top, they repurpose opinions down to all of these people below and then they just spew them back out. Yeah, and the and what what's the worst part about that is when you become your opinion, changing your opinion is death. So you're stuck. You're literally stuck. It's so hard to and I see this with people now with you know what's happened and you know information changes and they just they can't possibly change their opinion because it changes everything. Well, who am I then? And and I you know it's like killing myself. Dude, that's such an amazing point. I, I talk about this all the time and you're so right. The fact that your side sees an absurd ideological belief as a show of fealty, right? You can imagine how ancient uh, tribes and ancient armies and stuff would have to show fealty to their local king or lord or baron or whatever, right? What you're doing when you take on an absurd belief is saying, I value adherence to the group ideology over what my own eyes and ears tell me. <laughs> that I will push aside rationality and reality in order to show to you that I believe whatever it is. If, for instance, um, somebody is adamant that uh, everything is cis, hetero, patriarchal superstructures, misogynistically keeping everybody down, despite the fact that it doesn't really say, oh, somebody believes that the world is the worst that it's ever been, despite every objective metric that we care about showing that that's not the case, right? What you're saying is I'm prepared to push reality to one side to show my fealty to this particular belief. And what that means is that other members of the group can see you as a reliable ally, well, if this person is prepared to fucking not see what's evidently in front of them, we probably don't need to worry or scrutinize about them with anything else. So it's a uh, loyalty display to your own side and it's a threat display to your enemies. It's like, oh, you think that you're going to convince me with that? This is how certain I am of, of my stance. And the problem that you have is twofold. If you do decide to have a non-typical opinion or some sort of nuance, by the other side, it's seen as a chink in your armor. It's seen as a weakness in terms of your adherence to the group. Mm -hmm. And by your own group, it's seen as a lack of loyalty. So there is very, very few incentives for people to not just adhere wholesale. The greatest, There's a term for those people. They're called useful idiots. Yeah. The, the greatest criticism you'll get, and I mean, the most heat you'll get if you change your opinion on something are from the, is from the group that you originally aligned with. So you see some political, you know, commentary all the time where somebody's on one side and then they go against their side on one topic, destroyed, it completely destroys them. And that's the biggest fear that we have is to be ostracized by our group because for all human history, that meant death. You know, if you got up and said something to your tribe and everybody didn't like what you had to say, mm -hmm. you're out you're cast aside. and you're dead. Well, if you know one opinion that a person holds and from that one opinion, you can accurately predict everything else that they believe, they're not a serious thinker, No, right? If I know your stance on abortion and from it, I know your stance on immigration and gun rights and the first amendment and the second amendment and on taxation and on capitalism and on blah, 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 all the way down. Yeah. But you, you're just, a, you've just taken this cookie cutter yeah. pre-prescribed like onesie outfit, right? Zipped it up and gone like, Hey, that's me. <laughs> No, everybody is so idiosyncratic, or they should be. I mean, there are some people out there, I'm sure there happens to be some people that just land perfect slap bang in the middle of Republican or Democrat beliefs, Christian or Mormon or fucking whatever it is, right? And they just, that happens to be genuinely where they come from. But for the most part, it's not, right? For the most part, somebody should be like uh, pro-gun, but uh, pro-choice, let's say. That would be something that wouldn't necessarily yeah, always... Yeah, and they don't even... It's like they have nothing to do with each other, and yet... Correct. It, you would find that you could probably accurately predict that somebody who's pro-choice is is for lots of gun control, which... And those are two topics that don't seem to be connected. It is very interesting. It feels like it's going to implode eventually because of that, because you have to believe that at least a, a large percentage of those people that are putting that onesie on deep down don't really believe they should be wearing it. You that. know what, though, uh, you, my, what I think when I look at it all is just it's human behavior and human behavior doesn't change. The, our environment changes, technology changes, circumstances may change, but our behaviors remain the same. And unless we're aware of our tendencies then it's just going to fall. I mean, you know, people look back. I mean, how many times have you heard people say, oh, if I lived in 
Nazi Germany. I totally would have rebelled and fought. No, you mm-hmm. wouldn't. You would have been like 99.9% of everybody. Carrying Nazi along with the rest of Yeah, them. like yeah. everybody else. Like you, you, most people would have, would have been doing that. Or well, if I lived in the Soviet Union, no, you wouldn't be in the gulags. You'd be doing exactly what they told you. It's all human behavior. So in my opinion, the key is to, we have to constantly become aware, rise up, be objective, have discussions. Otherwise you will fall back and me included, you will fall back into human behavior. It's just, it's just the way we're wired. Yeah. It's wild that you can have truth and accuracy in an individual, but lies and falsehoods in a group because group dynamics cause people to compromise on something that they know individually. Proven, by the way, this is proven. Studies have shown this time and time again, that group think mob um, psychology is very different from an individual. It's very strange. But they brought that, they they did a study in a classroom, a university classroom, which you might be familiar with, where they asked students to put their hands up based on which line they thought was shorter between a choice of three. (laughs) And everybody else, except for maybe one person or a couple of people in the class were plants that were all saying that an evidently longer line was shorter. Yeah, And sure enough, people just, Fucking, am I missing something? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's no, so okay, picture. there we are. <laughs> yeah. And the hand goes up. Yeah. That's like the one, the the other study where they have them wait in outside in a waiting room. Oh, then, it's a doctor's office. And then there's all, an they're like, like 80% the of them are plants. And so that you, yeah. the, like a, a bell goes off and they all stand up, you know? And so then before <laughs> ends, you, you just do it. Like how crazy yeah. is that? Yeah, the you know the one saying? Justin brought up was the elevator where everybody's yeah. facing one direction, single file line and people walk in and then, well, they get right. Yeah. I guess we're all looking in this direction. It's, yeah. You know, so, evolutionarily speaking there, there was, I mean, all of these behaviors had, um, you know, some purpose, right. And evolutionarily speaking, when you, you know, we lived in tribes for most of human history. I mean, it makes sense. Self-preservation. You got to do what everybody else does because you don't know that there's a snake over there or there's a lion or there's going to be, you know, a ditch that you're going to fall in. But um, with large societies, this can become toxic and poisonous and easily manipulated. Very easily manipulated. Chris, I'm going to change directions. You have um, a long history of fitness and exercise. You've mentioned earlier in the podcast splits and five by five. So you have some knowledge with exercise. You're very growth minded. What role for you does fitness play in all of that? And has how you view fitness and exercise for yourself, has that changed through that process? Like, was it for one thing before and now something totally different? Correct. That would be right. Yes. So as most guys, I'm 18 years old. I'm super, super skinny, like mm-hmm. 63 kilos. I don't know what that is in your money. Like 130 so. pounds. Yeah. It's super, super small, right? When I get to uni and I wanted to be more attractive to girls. I wanted to feel more confident. Uh, so I started training just total bro split. And this is what, 2006, 2007. So this is like even before the bodybuilding.com forums or maybe just at the very, very yeah. beginning of that. So it was like the wild west. No one knew what they were doing. No one knew what a macro was. This was before if it fits your macros, right? So yeah. I, I had no idea. So it's just, you go in, you left things, you like eat a lot of Subway and hope for the best. <laughs> I remember one of my housemates was adamant that like breaded chicken goujons were the best way to get protein in. <laughs> so, and then uh, I just kept training and I was training Works for, for Jerry. the way that I looked very much so. Uh, and then um, that carried me through a good way, accumulated a good amount of size pretty like relatively quickly. I remember the day that I broke 70 kilos, I was like 21 or something. And I was like, wow, like I'm massive, 71, 70 kilos, 71 kilos is fucking huge. And uh, yeah, I just kept on going, kept on going. And then it got towards maybe 24, 25. And I was just a bit sick. I was kind of bored of um, doing more bro split type stuff. So I went on to do Thai boxing, Muay Thai. I went out to Thailand and fought out there, which was fun. Then came back, did some more boxing stuff, got into CrossFit 2000 and sort of 16, 17. Uh, and the change, whatever you want to say, like philosophically was that previously it was something I did to just look good. Whereas now it's something that I do to feel good. And i still want the byproduct of looking good from it, but I just didn't care how I felt previously. If I was jacked, but felt like shit, that yeah. was worth it. Yeah. And it didn't care what my blood sugar was doing. I didn't care about how I was performing mentally. Whereas for me now, my my main pursuit is the podcast, right? I want to be as dialed in as possible mentally for the podcast and whatever can support that is good and the gym supports it. Yeah. Fitness has, uh, you mentioned this earlier too about, um, you know, Sunday, you know, Sunday sermons. Yes. There is, you know, we interviewed Bishop Barron a while ago. He's a Catholic bishop, very smart man. And and I asked him some questions about other religions. He says, you know, there's spiritual truth 
and lots of different practices. And after that podcast, I thought, I think there's some spiritual truth in fitness. Not, not necessarily because you're seeking spiritual enlightenment, but because the discipline and the process of it, I mean, the squat rack has been, you know, called the altar, right? Go to the altar of the squat rack or, you know, gym is my church. There's definitely some spiritual truth. And I think you figure this out after doing it for a long time, because we all started like you did, you know, wanted to look good, but you stick to it long enough and it kind of becomes this like practice, this yes. almost like this spiritual practice. Have you mm -hmm. found it to be kind we of have, We have rituals around it as well, right? This is why I've always struggled to train in the house. So we've got a ton of stuff in the garage where me and my house might live. But there's something about getting in the car with your boy and your pre-workout or your knocko or what, kill cliff or whatever you're drinking, putting the music on, arriving at the gym, putting your bag down, speaking to the receptionist. It's ritualistic. Mm. You know, it's part, you do it at the, usually at the same time each day. There is a prescription. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very transcendent. Um, that being said, since I've been in Austin, I have become uh, the equivalent of polyamorous with my gym memberships. So this is a, <laughs> this is a hack. You're not monogamous with your <laughs> non-monogamous non gym memberships. Yes, correct. This is a fucking great hack. And it only really works if you're in a place that's got a ton of good gyms. Yeah. But I must have, I think I've got three or four different gym memberships yeah. now. Uh, so I've Great got fitness community out there. Fucking a lot phenomenal. of people are very active out there. Absolutely yeah, phenomenal. Sure. So Lift ATX, great gym, indoor, outdoor, garage, old school style bodybuilding gym, but a really good split of guys to girls, which makes you feel a little bit less like, I don't know, in Sally by going there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you go into a bodybuilding gym and there's like half a woman in there yeah. and you think like, oh God, like this is, you go in there, it's a good split of guys and girls. Gold's gym I use if I'm prepping for a guest and I just want like a quiet session where I can just chug away and do bits and pieces. Uh, on it is really, really fun. They've got a ton of unorthodox equipment in there, reverse hypers, belt squats, all sorts of fun shit. Kettlebells. Yeah. Yeah. Bells. yeah, exactly. Um, so, having a bunch of different gym memberships is a hack. If somebody's feeling like their training is falling off a little bit at the moment, I would highly recommend just switching the facility that you go to. And uh, that, that's been really good for me to have different locations for different types of days that I want to go to. And especially in Austin, like memberships aren't that much, like 40 bucks, 50 bucks a month. You can accumulate this for the price of one bigger name, one like in a lifetime fitness or whatever. And you can accumulate all this. Adam did this. I shared, I shared this hack. I used to have like, depending on where I was in, in my training cycle, where my mindset is like, it would, I would choose the gym based off of that. It's like, Good Oh man. yeah, I need to be more in, I think more inward. I'm going to be, go to this place. It's so quiet. It's yep. an older population. I yep. like going there for that. I sit in the sauna afterwards. Oh, I got to get after it. The gold's Brunel's got all the competitors. I need someone to push me and see someone else lifting heavy. So yep. I love that. I think it's a great yeah. hack uh, to really bounce works. around all of them. Yeah, I like the old dungeons. That's my favorite kind of workout. Mm -hmm. I like to go in and feel, I don't like it to be too new. I mean, I work out in a gym now that's like that because that's, it's accessible and, and convenient. But if I had a choice and I have four kids and I, you know have work and I could just go pick, I would drive to an old dark, dungy, chalk filled dungeon mm -hmm. that just yeah. feels better. sodas. <laughs> yeah, you know, like uh, like Dorian Yates. Uh, you ever watch his old videos of him working out? And uh, yeah, like that. That was a basement. He worked out. There's no windows in that. I don't know if people knew that or not. But yeah, yeah. he actually had to go downstairs. Blood and guts. Yeah. That series. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, a, you yeah. know. And I, I really want to work out in a place like that. Come on, Diesel. Yeah. Come on, Diesel. <laughs> 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 fucking epic bro yeah. there's never been another training vlog like that again every single YouTuber has tried to recreate Dorian Yates blood and guts training vlog and everybody's fallen short yeah. no, no it's just, the intensity in those is just palpable yeah, and original too yeah, you you know, can't everyone that. needs that guy as their training partner yeah Squeeze it in! <laughs> Fucking epic. Yeah, you gotta watch that. If anyone hasn't seen that. Blood and Guts on YouTube. Chris, yeah. you uh, you mentioned your your housemate. Is that your business partner? No, no. So business partner, uh, me and uh, Darren, my previous business partner, have parted ways because I exited the uh, club stuff. So he took back all of the share. Uh, I worked an exit from that last year. He's absolutely flying. I caught up with him over Christmas. We're still best friends. Uh, I live with Zach Talander, weightlifting YouTuber. Oh, okay. You know him? Oh, uh, Coach know. ZT. Um, he's phenomenal as well. He's a big stiff idiot, but he is, um, <laughs> he's great. And uh, we, we very much get on. What I like about America is the positivity and kind of the uh, outgoing extroversion that just seems to be a bit more than it is in the UK. And he has been a very good, um, 
counterbalance to my British stoicism. Right. Let me ask you about that. So my wife's family is from England and one of my best friends was from the UK. And one thing I appreciate, especially one of my best friends, what I appreciate so much is your sense of humor and you, I mean, you guys basically fuck with each other. Yeah. Oh, like satirical. you just did right now. You were just talking about your housemate and you had to throw in. He's a big stiff idiot. He's yeah. a big stiff idiot. <laughs> yeah, he is. Like, uh, I feel like there's some value in that because uh, here it's like rude to do that or people don't get it all the time. I mean, my friend, his name is Bab. It's He's, endearing though when you say it. Oh, he used to say, oh my God, he used to call me all kinds of shit and just talk. And it was great. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Like, well, it, it keeps people down to earth. So this, this <laughs> like a, a little bro science-y uh, theory that I've come up with about the way that the UK and the US differ. So tall poppy syndrome is a big deal in the UK. If you diverge from the norm, you're going to be called out quite quickly. Like if you start doing anything different in school, you're immediately going to be called gay. Okay. It's like, that's fucking gay. Like, oh, why are you okay. trying to do that? Mm -hmm. So a uh, different time. But um, people are going to point at you and say, that's something that that is, is from the norm and it's not going to be super encouraged. Mm -hmm. What this means is as you grow up, you are kept incredibly humble by a crushing amount of piss taking, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, the disadvantage when you grow up is that this can lead to some quite sort of limited thinking and yeah. a little bit of a scarcity mindset. The alternative, when you look at America, is that there is still, for all that America's the worst cis hetero country in the world, it still has a big blue sky vision, right? People believe that they can be largely whatever it is that they want to be. There mm -hmm. are, the American dream is still very much alive and well, I think, culturally. Uh, and that means that when kids do try something new or do decide that they're going to become a business person at 12 years old or whatever, that's like applauded, that's raised up both amongst their local friend circle and, and online. Now, the problem that they encounter when they grow up is that the world doesn't necessarily deliver to them that which they were promised as a kid. Yeah. Mm. Everybody doesn't think you're special. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And this is why I think that the victim- Just your mom. You can't be everything. <laughs> the victimhood mentality in America is largely contributed to by this blue sky vision that you guys give to young people, which is not a bad thing. But if you could somehow blend the feet on the ground, um, spit and sawdust, work hard mentality that the UK has with the helicopter blue sky vision thing that the US has, I think that you end up with a really, really nice blend. And piss taking is like the enforcement mechanism that keeps people's feet on the ground. Um, but blending that so that you don't constrain what someone believes that they can achieve is uh that's the delicate balance right it's the value of bullying right justin mm -hmm. oh i, I like <laughs> I'm listening to you it, like i think this is a recent phenomenon that was definitely my experience growing up was you know everybody taking shots and it was very brutal right you know pretty much the same but i think i'm sure that's in pockets around the Correct. u.s in, yes. in terms of how i'm sure there's up. some positive pockets yeah. in the uk as well yeah, yeah. I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm sure it exists yeah, but, well what's is sal, sal sal has an evolutionary theory for it, right? That we that was important well, to, to test other yeah. men to make sure if I was going to go to battle with you, I didn't know you could take a little insult well, or whatever like that. Well, so. my 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 evidence for that is just look at the nicknames that men give each other versus the nicknames that women give each other. Like I, I tell the story, I had a friend going to a restaurant <laughs> and he was touring me around his new restaurant and I'm walking around. Good friend of mine, his name is Spiro, great guy, owns some Greek Greek restaurants. And we're walking through and he's like, oh, this is John, this is George or Susan. This, that's nine over there. Here's Fred. And I'm like, nine. I'm like, that's, he doesn't look German. Like, that's a weird. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, he goes, hey, nine. And he looks over and he goes, show Sal why we call you nine. He lifts up his hands and he's missing a finger. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I like, thought, yeah. and I, I cracked up because that's how guys give each other nicknames. You know, my, my father-in-law, he was. It's normally after an insecurity you probably he, have. He was born yeah. without, he was born without one eye. So he, has, he wears an eye patch or a glass eye. And his nickname, you know, with his buddies was one eye. That was his nickname. Oh yeah, one, one ball pat. Yeah. He had testicular cancer. <laughs> a terrible thing to call him. And we so, did. And my theory is that, and I, th I heard Jordan Peterson kind of talk about this and it, and it you know, it kind of strengthened what I, I think that men do that with each other because we evolved to hunt and go to war and do a lot of stupid shit and risk taking. And you want to mess with each other to see who's going to crack because however hard I'm going to tease you is nothing compared to when we're out there Correct. and we're trying to, you know, hunt or go to war. Like you got to keep going. Otherwise I'm going to die. So if we poke at you now and you cry, you're not coming with us. You can stay over here. We're going to go over there and go hunt. There's a, a rule in intrasexual competition when it comes to uh, friendships that, 
men will insult, insult each other and not mean it, and women will compliment each other and not mean it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's so true. Well, that's, true. Well, that's so true. I've, I've heard my heard wife that. say, like, someone will say, like, a, a woman will give a compliment, and then afterwards she'll be like, what a bitch. I'm like, what? <laughs> she totally meant this. I'm like, she said something nice. She said she had nice hair. It's like, no, what she meant was that her hair looked shitty. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've spent a good bit of time learning about intrasexual competition. So this is how men compete with men and women compete with women. And uh, frankly, all of us in this room should be very thankful that we're not women because female friendships are fucking vicious. They yeah. are way, way, way more vicious. Than what have you are. found? Tell us, share some of the stuff. Fucking hell, man. So, <laughs> I mean, this has been, there's two episodes that people should go and check out. Dr. Tanya Reynolds, which just came out very recently, and Joyce Benenson. Both of them are on the Chris mm. Williamson YouTube or uh, Modern Wisdom, Spotify, whatever. Um, one of the interesting ones is the effectiveness of sexual gossip that women use, right? So, if you look at, on average, how men derogate each other, they will derogate each other through um, pokes at their level of masculinity and sexual prowess. Mm. So you'll say, like, uh, you're a soft, small cocked bitch. Yeah. Like, that would be the sort of thing. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Whereas soft, small cocked bitch. Whereas if you were to look at what women will do, they will tend to uh, derogate chastity, right? So um, chastity and, and youthfulness slash attraction. So like, you're a fat slag or you're a fat whore. Yeah. Like that would be where they would go. And this is so funny, right? Because it identifies just that little thought experiment. Think back to what you as a guy call your guy friends, or if you were a girl, how you would insult a man that you didn't want to feel good. You would start to try and poke at his manhood and his sexual prowess. Yes. And if a guy wants to make a girl feel bad, even if it's just someone that cuts him up on the street, right? Like where's the first place that you go if you're going to like shout an expletive at a woman? You're going to call her like a whore or like a stupid bitch yeah. or something, right? As opposed to, so you, you have this divergence. The reason that sexual gossip is so useful is that chastity is something that men really value in women, right? They don't want a partner that is super promiscuous because male parental uncertainty, i.e. not knowing whether the kid is mine or not, means that I need to have um, the, the greater sense of loyalty uh, and certainty that I have that this woman is not sleeping around, the more comfortable I can feel. This is why in studies they show that women would be more upset if their partners fell in love and didn't sleep with the, someone else. Correct. And men are the opposite. Correct. That's correct. Yes. And uh, the interesting thing that you see with this sort of sexual gossip is that it is a precision targeted tool that women can use and it works within all of their intersexual competition. So uh, women don't want to have upfront physical violence with each other. They want to be as subtle and safe are the, the two things that they'll try and do. Safe as in no one can see that it's actually them that's delivered it and subtle as in it would be very hard and obvious to, to point out. So sexual gossip, let's say that I'm going, um, do you know what it is? I'm really worried about Mary. Uh, she just keeps on spending all of this time with different guys. And I'm just so worried that she's going to get hurt. And I, I keep on asking her to go out for dinner, but she keeps blowing me off for all of these different dudes. And I'm just, I'm just really worried about her. What she's saying is Mary's a whore and she's sleeping around. <laughs> right? <laughs> so venting is a very specific type of gossip. And it is this sort of exasperated um, personal complaint that, very subtly delivers a message about somebody else. If I say Mary's a whore and you should avoid her, that's quite open-faced, right? That's mm -hmm. neither safe nor subtle. However, if I vent, it feels like me just naturally letting go of some discomfort that's occurred. Now, what it does, if you do that type of sexual gossip as a woman about another woman, it broadcasts your sexual chastity because you immediately- Because you're worried about it. You immediately posit yeah. yourself as, I'm worried about Mary, but me, I would, I would never- ever consider all of these different guys. I'm just a pure individual. I'm just here looking out for my for my friend. So first off, it broadcasts yours. Secondly, it's almost impossible to disprove. Like you can't run around town showing people all of the sex that you're not having. Like that's not a thing that you can do. And then finally, it really points a finger and derogates women that are the biggest competitors. So men, it seems infidelity from men is done with women that are sexually open and uh, like visually uh, provocative. Those are the women who are precisely the easiest targets of sexual gossip because it like it makes sense. It's like, I don't know, does it? Like this, maybe this girl just doesn't like wearing a lot of clothes but doesn't actually spray it around. There's like been tons of girls that I've known throughout my time in nightlife who'll go out dressed provocatively, but no one ever goes home with. So it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correlation. But yeah, sexual gossip is 
uh, this just this precision targeted tool broadcasts the uh, gossipers sexual chastity uh, derogates something very important about the woman that they're talking to uh, and also is this sort of safe and, and subtle thing as well yeah I, when you have when you have kids of, of both genders um, you see this when they're really young like I remember when my older kids were younger, I, you know, I'm talking like first grade and you'd see the little boys running around playing and then one boy would like push another boy down and then they'd cry and, ah, and the teacher would separate them and then they'd go play again. And then another boy would take something and from another kid and then they, you know, fight and then they'd start playing again. And then I, and I, rem I remember this like it was yesterday. And then I'm looking at the little girls and there was this one little girl that the other girls weren't playing with. And I walk over and I kind of listen in and I can hear these first graders first grade. And they're saying, don't play with so-and-so. I don't like so-and-so. Don't play with her. They had organized a group to ostracize this one little girl. Whereas with the boys, it was like, I'm going to punch you in the face, take your stuff. The teacher comes over. And then we'll be best friends after yeah. that. And yeah. then we're okay. <laughs> yep. totally. Well, this is why male and female friendships are so fascinating in their differences that um, men need to be able to get on very, very quickly with other guys within their group, right? Yes, I need to trust you. I need to trust that you've got my back. But if we're going to, it's like me, you, grab spear, go get mammoth. Like right. we're going to go take this fucking thing down together, which means that you need to very quickly be able to bond together yes. and you need to not have any underlying nasties that are lurking within this. Whereas women who would have done what's called allo parenting, like this sort of distributed shared parenting of non-kin children amongst friends, aunties, etc. I'll go get some berries, we'll bring them back and then you can look after the kids for a little bit and do all the rest of it. It's much more important that women know a, a small group of incredibly tight friends, but that they ostracize the ones that mm -hmm. aren't a part of that group. An interesting thing that you see uh, for the denial of sex differences crowd, which is just the most insane, silly, most insane philosophy that I've ever heard. Um, Joyce Benenson did this research where she looked at kindergartners. So three years old ish, three and four years old. And uh, she's observed hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours of these kids. And the girls, if you look at what the girls are doing and what the boys are doing, it is precisely getting themselves ready for the sort of roles that ancestrally they would have done. Mm -hmm. So the boys, they will create an enemy of some kind. Maybe it's another group of boys that they're playing some sort of team sport with. Maybe it's aliens. Maybe it's cowboys. Maybe it's whatever. What is that? Warfare. They're practicing warfare as children, right? We will band together over the, uh, and we will overcome an opposing tribe. If you look at what girls are doing, girls are keeping something alive. They're keeping a pretend rabbit alive. They're playing nurse. They're playing doctor. They're doing some sort of teacher role. They are keeping things alive. That's the fucking role that they're going to grow up into. And boys are- Killing something. Killing something. <laughs> <laughs> Warfare. the guns yeah. and spears. Precisely yeah. correct. Yes. And you think, okay, this is at age three or four. It's cross-cultural. It, it, this is not socialization. This is what boys and girls are- disposed, predisposed to do. Another really interesting thing. So the discussion about uh, trans sports, right? Let's fucking kick this third rail. This is something that nobody ever talks about. I don't know why this is a third rail, by the way. This is so ridiculous no. to me, but anyway. So this is something that no one ever talks about. Everybody relies in the discussion around um, trans athletes in sports exclusively on the power thing, right? Almost exclusively on the power. It's bone density, it's muscle mass, it's all the rest of it. Nobody bothers to look at the different mental capacities that men and women have, because even the most ardent anti-trans in sports promoters haven't done the work to look at the fact that men and women mentally are incredibly different in terms of their capacities. At age three, there is a 50 to 70% disparity in throwing accuracy between boys and girls at age three. Brain scans can determine somebody's sex up to a 96% accuracy by knowing nothing else about them, just through their brain scans, right? So men, males have a better, what's called spatial rotation. So they're able to manipulate 3D objects in their mind. And you can imagine why this would be useful. I've got some wildebeest going left to right. I have a spear in my hand and I'm running in this direction. I need to be able to work out how fast it's going, how fast I'm going, how fast this spear is going to move. And I need to get all of them to intersect mm -hmm. perfectly, right? Women have better uh, uh, memory localization. So this is why men lose their keys around the house and women find them, right? That they are very good. Um, games where you have, you know, cards down on a table and you've got to turn two over and, and match them. 
women will piss all over you when it comes to that. They will wipe the floor with you with regards to that. Their ability to do local locals, uh, memorization just is phenomenal. Why would that be? Well, women wouldn't range as far as men would. They wouldn't need to know how to navigate themselves back as well. Men over long range finding have better um, return accuracy in terms of where they're going, which is why like women don't know where they're going without GPS is like a, a bit of a meme and a cliche, but it's also generally true. But also guys don't know where the fuck they put their keys and they can't keep the house tidy is also true. Women need to know that bush is good in June, but it's not very good in August because the berries become bad. And I need to know where the best water is, where the best rocks are, where the best cave is, where the place that we're not supposed to go is. And and that's this local spatialization. So when it comes to trans athletes in sport, everyone can say, um, we don't want fighters in the UFC because fundamentally, you know, mm. a person that's grown up as a male for almost all of their life is going to smash seven shades of shit out of some poor unsuspecting girl, quite rightly. But when you're talking about athletes going into especially throwing sports or kicking sports or ball sports, like there's a reason that the WNBA isn't quite as exciting as the men's and it's that mentally the capacity of the athletes is optimized for something else. You did touch a third rail here. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Okay. So the physical, cha the physical um, differences are obvious and I think that's why people focus on them. Correct. What you're talking about is doesn't seem as obvious, although when you discuss it and think about it, it is quite clear. Now, what does this mean? What this means is, and by the way, just to be clear, generally speaking, men and women are far more similar than they are different. Correct. It's at the ends of the extremes where you see the- Like in professional sports. Yes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when you, if you look for like the most empathetic, nurturing, you know, person who can read someone else's emotions from a distance, you're going to probably see mostly women, if not all women. Correct. If you're looking at for the most violent, most single-minded- you know, whatever, then you're going to probably find most men and sports is the extremes. Correct. Professional sports is the 1% of the 1%. I mean, it, you know, I, I've never competed uh, at high levels in sports, but I did do martial arts and I did, you know, go against black belts who were local black belts. And then I would go against black belts who are world champions. And it's like a different, it's not even the same species, Correct. like a normal black belt versus a world champion. I might as well have been going against a child versus, you know, a gorilla. It was so different. So these are good conversations to have precisely because I think it helps us understand each other. Like I'm married. Okay. And if you're married, it's very important that you grow with each other and try to understand each other because you're going to communicate to, first of all, you're two individuals, but then you're also a man and a woman in, in many cases. And it's, it helps to understand how women think and how men think so that when you communicate, you're not thinking that you're talking to your girlfriend or your guy friend. You're like, well, I'm talking to my wife and she's explaining something to me and she's telling me how she feels and she doesn't want me to fix it. She just wants me to listen to her. Correct. Whereas if Justin comes to me and tells me how he feels, he wants me to fix it. He yes. wants me to give him an answer. He's yeah, not just you can empathize but not sympathize and the reverse is true as well. Yeah, there's yes. this thing called a cross-sex mind reading which is what you're talking about. It's a failure of cross-sex mind reading. And it happens a lot in mating. Um, you have a, an over-perception and an under-perception bias of attraction, right? Men on average believe that the woman that they're speaking to is more attractive to them <laughs> than <laughs> she is. And women on average believe that the man that she's speaking to is less attracted to her than they are. So even just in that one example of, uh, let's say, uh, an awkward encounter in an office, right? Where the guy's like, oh, she keeps on lingering her eyes at me. And the woman's like, oh, totally isn't he nice? She's like, she's like I got something in my eye. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Um, and even in that situation, you can see one person sees one world and another person sees another world. It very much is two different yes. uh, existences that are going on. And yeah, absolutely. The, the, the way to transcend your programming is to first become aware of it. This is, this is one of the reasons why, among other reasons why um, you see like the, the, the popularity of things like OnlyFans and it, the, the big, big money makers are women. Part of it is the, that men are more visually stimulated, but a big part of OnlyFans, because pornography is free. So you think, why is OnlyFans so popular? It's because guys think that these girls actually like them. Oh, you know, I send her stuff mm -hmm. and she comments me and, you know, she actually kind of like, it's like back in the day when you go with yeah, your buddy to the strip club syndrome. and you leave and your buddy's always Stripper like, oh, no, no, syndrome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she actually, she yeah, actually but you know, what's me. most ironic about that point that I think is crazy or that I think is just the, the person who goes to the strip club and the person that goes on the OnlyFans, I actually think they know that and yet still partake. 
Yeah. Like, I, 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 how often have you met somebody who goes to strip club and really believes that he's coming home with one of the strippers? Like, no, no but they really believe that she liked them. And then same thing goes with the OnlyFans. Like, I mean, do you, this, this girl's in Australia, you're in the States. And I, I think they're actually even aware that it that's happening or the assistant is actually probably, but it's like you want to. Bro, you want to fucking bring this full circle? Yeah. Imagine when uh, chat GPT yeah. is deployed <laughs> on the back end of OnlyFans <laughs> and they don't even need some Vietnamese virtual assistant yeah. to do dirty talk because you're just going to be speaking to chat GPT. Imagine how scalable it's going to be for that. Right. You're going to have a 24 seven dirty talk sex partner. They programmed that in sex robots already to be able to sex to you. Uh, <laughs> there's a guy that married there's this dude in Japan yeah. that married a hologram oh a hologram oh that's gonna Wait, happen what? he's married a hologram I'm gonna yeah. make I'm gonna make wow. a prediction right now I'm gonna predict that the next humans are so weird the next civil rights movement the next big crazy civil rights movement is gonna be people demanding rights for uh, artificial intelligence robot lives matter yes yeah. that's gonna be the next big one because they're going to be somewhat indistinguishable, if not totally indistinguishable from humans. They'll say everything you want. They'll be very charming. They will have the technology to read your pupil size and pulse and skin temperature, know exactly what to say, what to do. And people are going to love them. And we're going to fight for their right to have rights and get married and do that kind of stuff. I think that'll be the next big, huge. A decade ago, a robot was given citizenship. I, I think it was Singapore that gave it full citizenship. And that was really dangerous. I had a, a couple of great conversations around robot ethicists. There's a lot of people that are working very hard at this, right? To like really think like, hang on, hang on, hang on, let's fucking pump the brakes on this stuff. Um, and he said that it was something that nobody, it's created a precedent, which is actually pretty fucking concerning. Like being able to give a robot citizenship. What does it even mean to, Okay, so that robot's a person with rights. Vote. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. 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 It's really, really strange. Yeah, I think they did it kind of like as a public publicity thing, not mm -hmm. really realizing what it could potentially mean. But that's like, like, what are you doing? Like, that's going to be weird. I feel like the future, I feel like there's going to be a future market for, I don't know what you would call it, organic, you know, media, organic content. Like, now you go buy a car that's made by hand, even though it takes way longer, yep. and machines probably make it even more precise. It's more expensive. Human crafted. Yeah. I feel like we're going to have to eventually make our podcast. It's going to say, you know, Mind Pump, organic by real humans. And yeah. people are going to listen to it and be like, oh, these guys mess up all the time. They're not as good, but, you know, yes, it's it wasn't, real people. It, it wasn't like Mind Pump AI, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Dude, I, it's, it's really, really fucking concerning, but I... Again, it comes back to that convenience thing, right? You know, if, if you can get more, better, crafted, only fans, quicker response, better nudes or whatever it is that you want out of it, it's going to be difficult for people to say no to. Yeah. They mm -hmm. won't. They won't, I, for sure. You know, yeah. I wanted to ask you some questions around uh, business. Yep. Uh, I don't. I haven't actually heard you talk much uh, about your business. Um, what has that journey been like for you? Did, did you have any monetary motivation behind everything that you did? Are you trying to scale and grow? Is it just you and a partner? I've, I haven't heard you talk about anybody else. Like, tell me a little bit about the business uh, behind Modern Wisdom. Cool. So it's very, very stripped back. It's a straight up creator um, economy at the moment for me. I work with a bunch of partners that I absolutely love. Crafted London, number one men's jewelry company in the world is a sponsor. Gymshark, My Protein, Better Help, Athletic Greens, et cetera, et cetera. Ton of partners I absolutely adore, uh, but I'm not monetizing uh, with my own products. I don't sell anything. I don't have courses. I don't have coaching. There is basically no back end. There's no members area. There's no nothing. And the team consists of me, a video editor and an assistant. And the assistants uh, only been with us for about 18 months to two years. I so I assume this is by design. Correct. Yeah. And, it's very lean. Um, I'd spent almost all of my twenties managing teams of between 500 and a thousand people. So when you run a nightclub, in order to fill a nightclub with about 2,000 kids, you need 1,000 people to bring one friend. <laughs> so it, it's you need a lot of staff. And I enjoyed learning how to manage people, but it was something that I was really ready to kind of strip back. And I very much enjoy, me and my editor, Dean, uh, just it's us two making everything happen, making sure that the episodes are up, getting the edits in there. Now, when it comes to the bigger productions, we've got a team that we come in to do this, this Goggins thing that I keep on harping on about um, that we can put in the show notes or whatever, if mm. people are interested. Uh, 
we fly an entire cinema crew out with the director of photography and they build custom sets in the middle of sound stages. I was going to ask you about that. That set looked way too sick to be just like thrown together. It wasn't, it didn't exist. Yeah. It was custom made. Everything was custom. Wow. Custom lighting, custom backdrop, custom built boards with the brick. That's not real brick. What'd you spend real. to put that all together? About 20 grand. Yeah? yeah, that's actually not that's bad. Not that's not bad for what I saw. It's not, but that is because I've built up an existing relationship ah. with all of the mm -hmm. different guys. Ah. So I know this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. And then there's one guy in the middle who is able to wrap it all together uh, and, and make it happen. Yeah, because originally organizing that probably was a monster, but now you've got your system. Correct. Yes. And that's unbelievably powerful. And we're going to do some more cool <laughs> stuff this year. You know, if and when I get the next, whatever the next big guest is that comes on, we'll continue to do that and to really try and push the limits in terms of production. Like how far can we go in terms of cinematography? But when it comes to the business, man, it's just, it's good affiliate deals. Um, I am going to start releasing some products this year. There's some stuff that I think that's missing in the market that I really want to do. So we are uh, partway through moving that along. Uh, I think I'll be writing a book this year as well, which will be fun. But I don't know, there's, I'm not really materialistically minded. And it's like a, an ongoing debate in my mind at the moment that is probably quite timely to talk about. I don't have massive material goals for my life. I already earn like uh, fucking 50 times more than I ever probably should have done coming from the place like, like the most working class town in the UK, which was famous only for having the highest teen pregnancy rating in England. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm already- What part? It's called Stockton on Tees. Okay. It's Teesside. It's 50 miles south of Newcastle, which is where I went to university. Okay. It's just below Scotland. And um, I'm already so far out ahead. But since coming over to America, that blue sky vision that I talk about with you guys has, uh, don't leave it on the table is the thing that keeps coming to mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, how much of this are you just, like just leaving out there because you don't, it would be easier for you to not push. It would be easy for you to not monetize mm -hmm. more effectively, to not write the book because everything's comfortable. We've been talking about comfort a lot throughout the conversation today. I'm like, okay, fucking hell. Right, well, maybe maybe I do need to write a book. Maybe I do need to to um, try and release some products because it would add value and maybe it would you know, generate some revenue and maybe it would take people away from other uh, either products or courses or uh, learnings that I think would be suboptimal. And I think I could maybe even add more than where they're going at the moment. But uh, I'm not, I've realized I'm not actually all that massively business minded. Even though I was a, bit, a business owner, managing director for a decade and a half, I was just really good at doing a thing yeah. and that grew. And it's the same with the podcast. I'm really good at having a conversation with someone and it grew. So I'm probably going to need to get, I'll need like a business manager or something who can just come in and like work out what would be really aligned, really virtuous with high integrity, but also monetize more mm -hmm. effectively and then spread the message more. But my own, the only thing that I'm bothered about is good conversations. Yeah. Good conversations, interesting people. Yeah, you come, you come off that way. That's why part of the reason why I asked. Well, share with me then your, your relationship with money. Because actually someone who comes from small town, I also I'll come from a small town. I actually had big dreams and wanted so much more. And I, so I have an interesting journey of not having, having, not being happy, then com like coming uh, full circle. Yes. So tell me ab about your relationship and journey with money coming from small town. Yeah. So um, just your, your entire perspective of what is a good wage is so skewed. Yeah. So like, let's say that p a pound is like $1.2, something like that, yeah. probably like 1.05 at the moment. But um for me, anybody that earned more than 20,000 pounds a year, it's like $25,000 or $30,000 was like insane, like absolutely crushing it. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, oh, well, you know, if I come out of university, even when I went to uni, right? If I come out of uni and I get on a graduate scheme that pays 25, remembering I've done two degrees, did mm -hmm. a bachelor's and a master's, both in business. Well, I could come out and start working for Accenture. And maybe if I get paid sort of 28,000 pounds, that'll be, that's like an insane starting wage. I remember one of my friends at uni, one of my housemates started working for Lidl. Do you have Lidl? It's like Aldi. Okay. okay. Um, and their graduate scheme is the most trial by fire thing ever. It's like 80 hours a week for two years, but you get a free Audi A4 and it's 40 grand a year. So this guy just crushed himself for like 24 months, hated his life, but he's earning 40 grand a year. And we all thought he was the shit. <laughs> and um, relationship with money is just, I, I, I'm really not very materialistic. Mm. Most of the stuff that I wear has either been gifted to me by companies or is like stuff that I've had to pick up when I'm going away on some some trip or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
passed I, down from parents or I mean, where does it come from? I, I actually really, really like it. It's one of the things that I'm happiest that I inculcated in terms of a, a value in myself. Um, mom and dad were never very keeping up with the Joneses. E, it was uh, birthdays and Christmas celebrations weren't particularly uh, big occasions in terms of the the presents. It wasn't really about the presents. And I think that I can see in some of my other friends, parents who were more about keeping up with the Joneses, that um, they gave love through showing gifts, right? Uh, they showed love through giving gifts. And that means as they grow up that they're a little bit more finger on the pulse of, maybe I do need the new car. Maybe I do need the new shoes. Maybe I, it does matter what watch is on my wrist. Maybe it, and the way that I see it, if you are someone who is, similar to myself and perhaps you with not being super materialistic, it's a competitive advantage because the amount of money and possessions that I need in order to make me happy is like 10% of some of the friends that I've got. That's the number one common thread found actually in millionaires. A lot of people don't realize that is that their ability to live significantly below their means, not their job or profession or their degree or any of that other <laughs> shit. It's literally the ability to live well below your means. That's the most common thing amongst all millionaires. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But I, it, so yeah. And then the journey now is, is me kind of coming out the other side of this and thinking, right, stop leaving so much on the table. Let's really try and make a good impact. Um, I enjoy uh, raising up other people along with the show because for a long time, and you guys know this, right, that you're slipstreaming in the wake of other people who've got as much clout or more clout than you do, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm holding on to Jordan Peterson's coattails or Andrew Huberman's coattails or Jocko's coattails or Goggins's or whatever. And after a little bit of time, you generate your own momentum to the stage where you can move under your own steam and you can be that springboard for other people. Yeah. So Gwinda, the guy that I said that wrote that amazing TikTok article, I managed to get that article in front of Rogan and then he tweeted it. And it's like- That's where I read it. Yeah. I and it's like that, fucking yeah. like millions of people. I don't know how many impressions, like 5 million, 10 million people or whatever that have seen this article. And I was like, Hey dude, like, by the way, I think this has ended up in front of him. And then sure enough, he tweeted it that night. I'm like, that's fucking like, that makes me, that's a really cool feeling to do so that. So fucking gassed. Yeah. My editor as well, Dean, he got to leave a job that he wasn't super happy in. He's an unbelievable creative, fantastic photographer left that and got to go freelance doing whatever he wanted. And then the other half of his week is spent doing the podcast. And, you know, the first year that he was working with me, I think we both earned, because we were 50-50 on AdSense together from YouTube, he made like 50 bucks. And then the second year, he maybe made like a thousand bucks. And then two years ago, after we had a little bit of takeoff and up to now, he's driving around in this BMW M140i with a straight through exhaust V6 turbocharged <laughs> Batmobile thing. And that's been funded heavily by the podcast. And that gasses me up to yeah. think that because we decided to take a chance on this thing yeah. that he's now bah, 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 like, around the, <laughs> like being very dangerous when he drives in this rear wheel drive 400 horsepower car. So um, that's great. And I, I think, okay, well, if that makes me feel so good, maybe I can do that a little bit more. Um, but it's, it's, I've had to like reverse engineer it. I'm having to almost autistically step my way through. Why should I try and earn more money? Why right. should I try and monetize more effectively? Cause I just, the standard of life that I have at the moment is already great. I live in a house that's gorgeous with a cold tub outside. I've got a housemate that's cool. I do a job that I really love. I can fly wherever I want. You know, I, I, I get to, what would I do? I'd have like a slightly more expensive coffee. Like yeah. what am I, do you know what I mean? Like the things that I take my value from, I Uber everywhere in Austin. Right, right. Um, but then on the flip side, since being in Austin and being around guys like Tucker Max, who started Scribe Media, good friends with Aubrey, good friends with Michael Caju and Adi from Working Against Gravity. And I'm like, that pool is fucking nice. <laughs> like, that pool is really nice. And that new brand new it's Porsche nice. Cayman is pretty fucking sweet. Yeah. I know you've got a ranch and you've got a holiday home up in Vermont and that's cool and that's cool. Um, but it doesn't feel like I'm compelled and that's really well. It's uh, your. It's one of your great strengths. But I. I always say your greatest tell me about strength. Your, is, I want to know about your. Uh, your sort of little trajectory. Well, I. So I. We bounced around in nine different homes growing up. Most of them we were evicted from. My dad committed suicide when I was seven. My mom remarried into abusive relationships. To so to summarize, I had a less than privileged. Rocky. Yeah, <laughs> growing up, right? So, 
Um, and a lot of that was rooted from uh, root, the, a lot of the arguments and fights were rooted in us not having, not having enough, not mm. being able to pay. And so that really motivated me. And so all through my, I was working at a very young age and all the way through my teens and early twenties, I worked really hard. Like you, uh, my number was 50,000. I thought if I made $50,000 a year, I'd be rich. Yeah. Cause that was like more than my parents made combined with you know, raising four kids. So yes. I thought I would be filthy rich, uh, making that. And, you know, I had this arbitrary number in my head that once I reached that, like that was the, the number. And I actually reached that about 27, 28 years old. And uh, for about a year or two, I probably would have told you during that time, this is the greatest ever. I was flying to Vegas and paying for all my friends to do shit, the cool cars, all the cool stuff. And I woke up one day about a year to two years later and looked at myself in the mirror and I was in the worst shape of my life. Um, I had two, uh, two very close friends of mine from childhood. We, we fell out of a relationship. We were no longer friends anymore. The girl I was dating, dating had just cheated on me. I wasn't seeing my family and stuff like that. And I realized like, holy fuck, I'm the most unhappy I've ever been in my life. And I have this dollar amount. Despite of, all of the wealth. Yeah. And so now the cool part about that was it allowed this time that I, I didn't have to go work. I had enough money stacked up that I could live for a while and, and, and not worry about making a paycheck. So it really allowed me that time to self-reflect and go, okay, what does make me happy and what do I want to do? And I remember that health and fitness is always, cause I took a little hiatus from it to chase money. Um, uh, from fitness. And I, man, I, I've always loved that. I've always loved health and fitness and maybe I'm not going to be rich doing it, but that's where my heart is, my passion. I love helping people. And so I went back into pursuing that. It was right at the height of when Instagram and Facebook and YouTube was, was like 12 years ago or what that was really starting to blow up, you know, and you're starting to see people. And so I turned on social media. I didn't have any of it. So I was like a, a people person and uh, didn't really mess around online at all, turned it on with the intent to build a network of people to eventually build some sort of a fitness business. And that's actually how we all get connected. So we got connected and we're all, we were all doing different things, but actually all came together at one point and had a, a conversation in uh, my mother-in-law's house in the living room and we all hit it off and we started the podcast not with any intent necessarily to monetize and make money, uh, but because we had this information and content that we wanted to share with the world. And especially in our space that we felt was so convoluted with all this bad information. And we saw the rise of that and we wanted to disrupt it. We thought, and then hopefully other people would glom onto it and want to listen and share with their friends. And I mean, that's how mind pump really started to go and take off. But during that time, I, went from being the kid that was so driven and wanted money, had reached that point, and now my relationship has changed with it. I still enjoy the finer things of life. Like I still like having a nice car, I still like the nice watch, I still like some of those. It's never gonna be boring to fly business class. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, and I, I appreciate those things. So I, yeah. I actually really like, like that I had that journey, that I went from being very driven by that, getting a chance to reach it, and then yeah. realizing it's not all it's cracked up to be. There's a quote from Naval Ravikant where he says, it is far easier to achieve our material desires than to renounce them. Hmm. And what he means is that wow. you can drive a beat up Acora if your last car was a Ferrari, but if you go through your entire life wondering what it's like to drive a Ferrari, it's going to be an unopened loop that mm -hmm. you just never get past. And I think that uh, transcend and include is a nice way to look at a lot of the things that we've spoken about today, right? Okay, I have this um, endless list of guys and girls on the internet that I could date, right? I need to accept the fact that that is there, but I also need to transcend it. I need to understand that money might not be everything that is going to make me happy, but that I have this bias where if I don't achieve some of the things that I want to do, I'm always going to have that open loop in the back of my mind about what if. Yeah. And, you know, most people regret the decisions that they didn't make yeah. rather than the ones that they did. The most interesting part is, and, and ironic, is that when I let go of the chase of the money. More money came. More money came. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So that's the fun. The funniest Most thing about it is yeah. that I finally made that that switch over of like, oh, I really, it's not what's important to me, and then it all came in. So yeah. it was really funny how that yes. happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is that what we said at the very very beginning, it's it's super hard to compete with somebody that's having fun. Mm. It can be very very difficult. There was this study done on uh, Steffi Graf, German tennis player, mm -hmm. like savant German tennis player, and they rated kids in the German kids uh, tennis program on 
motivation to train and skill aptitude. And she came in as a 10 on skill and aptitude and a 10 on motivation to train. So even if you're as skilled as she is, she's going to outwork you. And to her, it's not even going to feel like yeah. work. It's yeah. unbelievably difficult to compete with somebody that's having fun. And nobody can beat you at being you either, right? There is one version of you. Every single different iteration and different encounter between all of your ancestors from the eukaryotic double-celled bacteria two billion years ago right up to now, it had to be that animal at that time in that ovulation period with that particular sperm. It had to be those two over and over and over and over again for 200,000 generations or however long it is, right? In order to be able to create this particular unique combination of genetic predisposition and then the way you've dealt with past traumas, your environmental uh, programming, that all of the things that you've gone through has created you. You know what's most crazy about that to me though is how many people think they want to be that person. Like you mentioned like a superstar, like tennis player. And you, I think of like the Stephen Curry's, the Michael Jordan's, the Tiger Woods. Elon Musk, right? Yeah. yeah these Musk. people that, that we, we see just the highlight reels of the, the fame, the money, the cool cars, the girls, all these things like that, but don't realize how potentially tortured they are inside and the formula it takes to be that that great at that, at that sport. At that one thing. And I've, I've been lucky to have been around a lot of these athletes and it's very, very rare that I find one that I would want to trade places with. Most of the people that you admire aren't superheroes. They're normal humans that have sacrificed pretty much everything in their life to be good at one thing. If you had the opportunity to look at the inner texture of an Elon Musk's life or, or uh, Kim Kardashian when she goes to bed, you probably wouldn't want to trade places with them. You don't know if Elon Musk hasn't had an erection in fucking six months because of how stressed he is. You don't know if Kim Kardashian can't bear to have a conversation with any of her sisters because of how tortured her inner family life is. You don't know all of these things, right? You only get to see what is shown to you. And Eddie Hall, I always use this example of Eddie Hall. Eddie Hall wins World's Strongest Man in 2018, I think. And he says straight after that, he, he quits, right? He leaves Strongman on the stage and he says it's for his grandma. He sort of holds the thing up and he's crying and he says, this is for you. Uh, and then he immediately retires from competitive Strongman. And somebody asks him, like, you, you know, you've just won. Like, do you not want to go for the like two-peat or the three-peat? And he says, if I keep on doing this, I'm going to be dead, single, and with no relationship to my child because his... He was like, what, six, four, 200 kilos, like 440 pounds this guy weighed. His blood pressure was through the roof. His heart rate was all over the place. His health, the, probably the drugs and the steroids that he was on wouldn't have contributed very well to that. Die, everything is fucked. He said he was training so hard and he was so obsessive about winning that his relationship with his wife was breaking down. Mm -hmm. His relationship with his kid was basically non-existent. Okay, I want to be the world's strongest man. I want to be able to be the guy that can stand on stage, hold the trophy in the air and say, mum, grandma, thank you for helping me. This is for you. Okay. Do you want to have no relationship with your kid, risk your health and also your marriage in order to be able to do that? Conor McGregor is another example. Everybody looks at Conor, this sort of savant martial artist that's having an unbelievable career. I actually think, I mean, now he's kind of embarrassing. He looks like he's going down. Super, super, super. He's like the most cringe guy on the internet. Mm. Um, however, when he was at his prime, you would say, that's the guy that I want to be. He's walking out on stage and he's like an artist, you know, mm. he's sort of this like demigod fucking artist, charismatic guy. Okay. Do you want to spend the first decade of your career living in the attic of your parents' house in Ireland with your girlfriend, with no idea about whether or not things are going to work out, going to the gym and rolling the same sequences, throwing the same combinations for hours and hours and hours and nobody picking you up, having self-belief, but not knowing if it's going to go anywhere. That's the price that you pay in order to be Conor McGregor. And most people wouldn't pay that price if they had the opportunity to do it. If you got to see the inner texture of the people who you admire's minds, you wouldn't pay that price. Right. This is what I tell people mm -hmm. when they say, I want to have a six pack. No, you don't. You really don't want to have six pack abs. For, fucking miserable. For what, yeah, what, what is, what's required of it, you don't want a to room make of that. people who've all had six pack abs. Yeah, it's fucking miserable. Yeah, it's just not. This, a, this not is a part good of the trait. reason why. You, if you, I don't know how much you went through our stuff, but you don't see any transformation photos. You don't see us doing all kinds of stuff like that. Is because we We're don't talk think about balance. We just well, we just don't think it's a it's a healthy message for a majority of people because you're not presenting the other side of that of yeah. what it takes to do that. And I went through 
what, three, almost four years of dieting for bodybuilding, became a pro uh, men's physique athlete. And I'll never forget Katrina, my wife looking over to me and she goes, is this going to be our life? And I was like, fuck, no, we're going to reach a point. I'm out of here. Yes. And it was really just to help catapult this, to use my name that I was building in the competing world to pivot right. over to this because, but I could see the, how many people get trapped in that. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. Well, it's the, it's far easier to achieve your material desires than to renounce them thing. Right. But if someone continues to, okay, now I've achieved one goal, but oh, well, I've got a local championship. How about I go for like a regional? Okay. Well, how about I go for a national? Well, how about I go to world? How about I go to IFBB? Like you can continue. There is always going to be another motherfucker out there that's going to be better than you. And even let's use this as an example, Tom Brady, how many rings do you need? He's only got 10 fingers <laughs> yeah. and he's got what? Seven championship rings. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's say he does three more and then he's out of fingers. Is that enough? Yeah. The gold medalist syndrome is a big deal. What do you do after you've done that? Yeah. Well, What's if you, going well, to where's your identity outside of that? Yeah. Who are you? Who, who are, are you? When you I'm let, sure when you let this, right when now. you let this thing. Well, go. imagine trying to reverse that though, after you've already double, tripled down and committed like someone like him. I mean, you're already, you've been all in for decades. Forever. Yeah. yeah. Listen, I, I've talked, we talk about this. You, I, he probably, someone like that would probably rather die on the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's like, once you stop, who are you? I mean, you know, we talk about this all the time that the value comes from the journey and not necessarily, or almost never from accomplishing the goal. We haven't spoken about him yet today, but Andrew Tate, one of my favorite takes from him that he's got is having things isn't that fun getting things is really fun. Mm. <laughs> and you realize that he is a man that has got essentially unlimited material wealth uh, as far as he's concerned. And his only enjoyment in life comes from getting more. He can't be happy with the things that he has, but that's the same with regards to, and it's one of the beautiful things about um, podcasting, curiosity, learning, skill development, is that it's an endless game that you can actually enjoy the process of there is always something new and interesting for you to learn about the world. Like today, the sexual gossip thing. It's, it's to almost everybody, it's kind of pointless, but it's kind of interesting. It's oh, wow. very interesting. I never knew the way that women use venting as this, and then maybe you see it and you go, oh, fuck, cool. It's like, <laughs> it's like unlocked this other area of life. And if you are the kind of person that listens to your show or listens to my show, you take pleasure in seeing code where they previously used to be computer program. Right. You go, fuck, like, that's why that thing happens. Or you watch an Eddie Hall documentary and you go, oh, shit, I didn't realize that he was actually on the cusp of this thing. And it was kind of cool because if he hadn't won at that, maybe he would have ended up being in a really bad health crisis or he would have been single or whatever. And you get to that for me is that's what fires me up. What fires me up is understanding the world with greater resolution, like understanding it with more detail. Yeah. And that's just it's just endlessly interesting. And I think that the game of satisfying curiosity is such a beautiful, endless game to play or a, 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 an eternal game to play. Yeah, the pursuit of growth, the pursuit of personal growth. If you fall in love with the pursuit, you're just always going to have a good time. Yes. Absolutely. Mm. Well, this has been great, Chris. Yeah. yeah, It's been a lot of fun having you on the show, Excellent. man. Excellent. I appreciate it, Paul. Appreciate yeah. you coming into the studio and, and doing this with us. It's been awesome. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, thanks again. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 